Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of this episode, we talk about the best foods to eat in the morning if you want to start your day off right, as well as other fun and exciting topics. In the second half of the show, the guys coach four live callers on questions such as, my coach has me avoiding squats, deadlifts, and overhead presses. Are they really overrated and a waste of time like he says they are? Should I train differently during a cut and a bulk? What is the best workout and diet for mental performance? And what is the best way to work out for longevity? All right, enjoy the show. All right, you want an easy way to reduce your appetite, improve your stable energy, and get your insulin levels to be more stable throughout the day? Check this out. If you just eat a breakfast that's high in protein with some fat and probably little to no carbohydrates, you'll probably eat less throughout the day, have less cravings, and have more stable energy. It's a simple hack, but start your day that way and then watch what happens. It actually makes a pretty big difference. Eat your meat. Yeah. You know, I like I like stuff like this because it works with your behaviors rather than it forcing you to follow like some kind of plan. Like yeah. it's like, okay, you're gonna eat breakfast anyway. You're gonna adhere to that a yeah, lot more eat effectively. Like, eat like a, you know, a three egg scrambled with a little bit of meat with it and some vegetables and boom, you're done. And then what happens is throughout the day, they find that when people start with a high protein and fat breakfast. Yeah, your blood sugar is nice and even. Throughout the whole day. Yeah. Even if you eat sugar later on or carbohydrates later on, whatever, had you not had the high protein breakfast, you would notice these bigger fluctuations. And we know this now with CGM studies, right? So continual glucose monitors will measure your glucose in real time in response to the foods that you eat. And they found that simply starting your day with protein stabilizes it throughout the day. Now, what behaviors do erratic ups and downs in blood sugar tend to promote? Cravings, irritability, overeating. So if you just start your day that way, it's like one small thing you can do that can improve or at least push your behaviors in the direction of helping you eat healthier and be leaner. So can I add to that hack? Yeah. I think that uh, this starts in the uh, evening with just portioning off like the, the dinner meat that you normally have. Because typically people eat carb-heavy breakfast and don't eat cook a meat or whatever. Mm -hmm. And because that part is a little time consuming and most of us have a, a main course uh, dinner that's centered around some sort of a meat is I would just, and I, we have these little tiny like Tupperware things is I would Tupperware off like four ounces. And that goes um, with your eggs. Yeah. And then in the morning, all I have to do is crack, you know, two or three eggs, depending on how big of a breakfast you want with that meat and just scramble, scramble it. it and then we throw a little, sprinkle a little, an ounce of cheese over the top of it. And now you've got this killer scramble and was super fast and easy. So I, I make breakfast yeah. most mornings for for Jessica and uh, that's exactly what I do. So um, like the other night we had uh, Butcher Box Tri-Tip. So um, Butcher Box company we work with, they deliver like grass-fed meats to your door and we always get tri-tips. It's like my favorite cut from them because they're really versatile. I do the, the cast iron skillet on both sides, put it in the oven really easy. If you season it well, it's really tasty. And so I'll have some left over and I'll serve her every morning um, two scrambled eggs with cheese and probably two ounces or three ounces of tri-tip and boom, that's your breakfast right there. And I like what you're saying, Adam, because you know, what's interesting about breakfast foods before the introduction of cereals. Okay. Breakfast used to be a protein fat meal. Mm -hmm. That's what people used to eat. Yeah. And then the invention of cereals came along, which by the way, some of the first cereals, people Toast. don't know this, people don't know this. The, one of the first cereals uh, invented or marketed was uh, cornflakes, mm -hmm. Kellogg's, Kellogg's cornflakes. Wasn't he <laughs> was trying there? to solve like yeah. some kind of um, masturbation problem? <laughs> he advertised I'm serious. it. It I'm prevented serious. masturbation. So I was yes. like, oh, eat this in the morning. Was go, that go the story? I, heard, I knew it was That's like true. a weird, a weird story that yes. went behind it. That it, he was trying. Okay, explain how making a cereal prevents oh, I masturbation. I don't think there's anything that I can explain. <laughs> I think it was all he just said that. Yeah, that's how he's. I don't know if it, it happened to him. He's like, man, when I ate this because then he feels tired. Like, I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have no idea. Do uh, you remember that story? I yeah, I'm looking it up here. Um, I'm trying to fact check it. We have we have on the show. Before. It says mostly false, but again, as Snopes, so I don't know if I can. No, no, no. Look not. up cornflakes prevents masturbation. Uh, just do that, and then you'll read. 
but that's the story. But anyway, nonetheless, uh, that's, you know, when breakfast cereals kind of hit the market, they're so convenient. They have a long shelf life. Um, so instead of taking, you know, 20 minutes to cook, mm -hmm. you just pour something in a bowl, add some milk to it. And now you have, you know, your quote unquote breakfast. And then it lasts a long time. A box of cereal doesn't go bad like other yeah. perishable foods. And so breakfast became, and this is the funny thing, by the way, it's funny to me how we have breakfast foods, lunch foods, and dinner foods. Yeah. Um, and that's just a, a, that's a product of marketing, but breakfast foods do tend to be carb heavy. Yeah. They all meals. look like cake now, you know, pancakes, like, uh, like French muffins toast. or little tiny cakes. Waffles. Yeah. Oh, it's true. You Isn't know, it wild too how our, our our cravings and everything have have shifted from that too? Like if you ever if someone's like, oh, I want breakfast right now. If you're like, hey, I've got some chicken and broccoli and rice in the refrigerator. Do you want me? Because you've that associated up? that with dinner. Yeah. People, yeah. What? Ugh. It would act like that's such a big deal not to do it. You know what broke that for me was competing because it was I had that was like what I was eating all day long. So so many times breakfast was dinner. It didn't matter. It was just like I had to hit these macros and it was what I had prepared. Yeah. And most of what I prepared were like Do you guys do you guys remember I, they don't really I don't know if they do this anymore cuz I don't watch too many commercials uh because streaming doesn't do the same. But when we were kids, you know, you watch TV and you had to watch the commercials. And anytime they had a breakfast cereal commercial, at the very end they're always like uh, part Fruit. of a complete breakfast. Yeah. And the picture would be box of cereal, bowl of cereal. Fruit. There'd be like three or four orange slices juice. of toast, a glass of orange juice, yeah. and an orange. Yeah. yeah. It was like 150 grams it's of like carbohydrates. All carbs. <laughs> yeah. Dude, well, I blame, I mean, look at our food pyramid. Yeah. You know, like they had this like insane, it was like 60 something percent carb focus. And then it between that and then how they attacked fat back when we grew up, oh. like that's how our whole breakfast, I think, changed because of that on top of the cereal. Eggs got demonized for a long time. Yeah. Eggs got and completely, bacon. and bacon got yeah. demonized uh -huh. for butter, got demonized uh -huh. for a long time. And they told you to eat margarine, which is, oh my God, that's so bad for you. Yeah. And eggs are incredibly, eggs are literally nature's multivitamin. They're so nutrient dense, so healthy, especially for children, especially for kids. In fact, the eggs, eggs are packed full of brain healthy nutrients. Like if you want yeah. your kid to grow up and have a healthy brain, you give them eggs. But yeah, it's funny to me how, I, you know what, I know how many tests I probably did poorly on because- oh, I know. You know, you know, I'm like, oh, I got a big test or whatever. I better eat, you know, I better fuel myself. And it was like five pancakes, toast, Dude, juice. every single uh, sports uh, event, game, whatever, like I would just load up on pancakes, carbs, you know. Uh, it just <laughs> would crash right before I'd get to playing. And it was just, I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, what does that say, Crazy. Doug? So, yes, it seems like it was uh, invented as a food for patients of a sanatorium in which he worked. So this is John Harvey Kellogg. And at its inception, the cereal was functional. It was supposed to be healthy and de deliberately bland and yeah. also designed to suppress sexual desire. That Okay, okay, that's what it was, Adam. You asked, how the hell is a cereal supposed to prevent? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's so, so the bland. thought was, yes, the thought was back then that anything stimulating would promote masturbation. So anything with flavor <laughs> or music that was lively or spicy. Bright or, color, just, yeah. So they're like, we're going to make the blandest, like, taste like nothing food. And which is funny, because then they turned it into, like, a breakfast food. They marketed everybody. Yeah. But they literally used to say, this is so bland, you won't want to jerk off So anymore. this is what wow. John Kellogg thought masturbation did. He said, mood swings, bad posture, acne, baldness, <laughs> <Bad> <laughs> stiff joints, palpitations, as I mean, well as lying. a taste for he's spicy lying. food. <laughs> Don't, what kind of posture? <laughs> Hairy hands, you know, for yeah, days. You know, this just, reminds uh, me of, since we went this way. <laughs> Bro, how big uh, of a problem was this in the, where I, he was working? Oh, my God. I know. So we just solved this. Guys, I'm seeing this everywhere, you guys. What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway program is MAPS Anabolic. This is the original MAPS workout program. It's the one that most people love the most. Here is how you can win it. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. And click on your notifications on YouTube. And if we pick you as the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section that you won free access to Maps Anabolic. Also, we got a sale going on right now on all of our at-home workout programs, our best ones, okay? So we put them together in what's known as the at-home holiday bundle. This bundle includes three, four, four programs. Here's what you get. Maps Anywhere, Maps Suspension, Maps Prime, and the No BS six-pack formula. So four programs, which would normally retail you for over $330. In this bundle, you only pay $99.99. 99 
If you are interested or you just want to learn more, click on the link at the top of the description below to get set up. All right, here comes the show. Did you guys see uh, Derek with uh, more plates, more dates, get after Dr. Molly? Uh, yeah. Today we're going to be reacting to this medical doctor who is a woman that she not only gets male level testosterone levels apparently, wants to literally fuck her coworkers. So, you know, uh, I don't know why you said that. Now you're gonna make me go off a little. Uh, I mean, why? What do you go off? Let me. Well, hear. no. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, I uh, he is super smart. Great content. Love his content. Yeah, super yeah. smart. The thing that uh, I don't like so much, and that a lot of people in our space do, is they they make a career out of making fun of or ridiculing other people, and it's like a thing. Like it's a big thing. Now that's not his main thing. He got again. He's got good information. I think he's very balanced with how he presents. Smart dude. But some people, like Greg Doucette, that's another guy. All his videos, all he do is making fun of other well, people. Well, okay, all so those are those are shit. two different categories for me because I think that I actually think that, and I agree with like Greg with has anno- a, with his annoying high pitched yeah, voice. Well, ah, Greg, Greg, Greg has a right. different approach. Uh, Derek, I think, has a. Um, I, I don't, or at least I, the ones, the stuff that I content of his that I've consumed doesn't come off like attacking. Even when he was kind of like clowning on dr molly for like he was doing it in in a respectful way like i don't i didn't yeah, feel like yeah, he yeah, was yeah. totally like back right. like some like greg and some of these other influencers can do this where they really like they're trying to create controversy yeah. where he get he is normally responding to his audience tagging him like crazy like hey we want to hear your take so the question on, is, this, was- is this possible could somebody literally show her claim is that she sat in a chair where somebody else, a, a male, had rubbed testosterone uh, on his forearm, Testosterone right? cream. Yeah, to test- testosterone cream, and it rubbed off on the chair. Then she sat in the chair and absorbed it, and relatively quick was starting Randy. to feel these senses of uh, sexual desires for her coworkers yeah. that she had never felt before. And she attributed that to the spiking of the, her, her testosterone. And so, you know, on that video, I, I don't know how viral her initial video went, but he got tagged a bunch on it. And then basically was breaking down like the likelihood that, that, but he did attribute that, you know, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be a placebo effect that she, as a doctor knows, like, what testosterone does and then she got it on her arm and probably got well over th- how fast does testosterone you have to apply it every day right so testosterone cream raises testosterone pretty quickly it's not like an injection where it takes like 24 hours before no it's the you're the opposite is true so the the injection is a faster way to delivery to your bloodstream and to change your 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 testosterone it's like six to 16 hours for the cream y- yeah so six to but six you have to apply it every day so what's your point so is it because it's a small dose every day Maybe, maybe Doug, when, look up how uh, peak testosterone concentrations was with. I mean, he broke cream. it. He broke all this down. Okay. Like he, yeah, he got. He actually so, broke down the difference between the injection injection versus the cream. How high? How long it actually takes to report back that the levels are elevated, and and this is all assuming that you got the full dose. Right is you know I'm saying so we're, we're not even talking about rubbing off on because because I, I know testosterone can raise dopamine and dopamine can definitely be involved because in imagine this okay so so a, a male rubs uh, a, a a full dose of testosterone on his forearm you got to think some of that is immediately getting absorbed he's not even getting all of yeah, it. yeah a tiny amount so it's got to be yeah a yeah. very small amount and yeah. the amount that that would then affect the the hormones. I mean, are- I've the only thing I've heard is like um, stories of uh, so people use the the cream and then hug their kids and then after a, <laughs> a while, you know, of like Your multiple exposures, a, a yeah, they start affecting. Yeah, them. I think I told you guys this story off air that I had was it a friend or a family member had a dog. Okay, here that was go. losing hair and having issues. Hold and, on a that's second. That's right. I remember you. Okay, so no, so this is what I thought. Okay, so the data suggests this is what Doug pulled up with testosterone cream that. Uh, after application, therapeutic levels are reached with concentrations of tw- over 1,200 nanograms per deciliter, which is a lot, within two hours. Additionally, consistent concentrations remain beyond six hours. That's what I thought. So cream is very fast absorption versus, uh, unless you inject like suspension, to st- which nobody does, right? Because you'd have to do that several times a day. So, But nonetheless, um, the effects of testosterone, I don't think you'd feel that fast, but you may feel dopamine. And then the placebo effect, you know, sexual desire is so complicated. It's not just hormones. It's so many other things. Like, totally. She could have been like, oh my God, I had to Yeah, your mood. It's, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, and that is the point that I That's think- That's what he was making. Yeah, that he was making is that, you know, there's a lot of other factors and to attribute that to this testosterone that rubbed off on a chair or something like that. I mean, I actually thought he did a pretty good job of responding. I thought she failed by responding again to him. I think she should have just left it alone. It was just like, it, it left it as it is, but she came back around and then like tried to attack yeah, him. Yeah, the, like, the, uh, the effects of testosterone from testosterone itself actually take a while for people to feel um, typically, but some people are more sensitive than others, but usually it's, it's like, what do they say in the studies that it's like four to six weeks when people start to report that they notice. Yeah. Um, and that was the stuff that he was saying it was, yeah. it was six to 16 is what I think, or six to 16 hours for people to report feeling the difference and yeah. stuff like that. So, sure, but I do know, I do know testosterone suspension Within an hour, you feel that. Like, I know athletes will take that before doing a powerlifting competition. You know, like injection, though. No, but suspension. Yeah, but so, injection. Yes, 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 yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I know that hits you like, boom, right away. And people- Yeah, no, say, I, I'm, I'm almost positive that the uh, injection is hits your system faster. Suspension, than. but not like uh, what you- like what Sipinate? Yeah, so that's, so that's a slow. That takes 24 hours to hit peak concentrations, and then it's a slow decline. It's attached to an ester that's a slow releasing. So suspension is just testosterone and water. Then there's uh, different esters that and have there's slower. There's enanthate, which takes even longer. I a think. little bit longer than than sipinate, but yeah, it's a, yeah. but um, but yeah, cream is fast. That's why they have to apply it every single day on whatever. And people put on the arm, their leg. But yeah, you're right, Justin. Um, there's been stories of like men using it, and it gets on their pillow, and then their wife uses their pillow. And mm -hmm. then she starts to notice masculinizing effects like, you know, a year later. Like, what's going on? Why is my... Yeah, right. I would imagine like the compounding hey, effect. Yeah. That was like the, yeah. what I was telling yeah. you about the dog, right? So this person, I can't remember who it was that was, that was but was taking, and it was a female that was taking uh, testosterone, but using the cream. So just a mild amount, but, you know, from petting, petting her dog. Her dog so, got it? No. So her dog... Uh, had like, like all losing this, hair was something? losing all hair yeah. by by its neck and like she had taken it to multiple vets and nobody could figure out what was going on He's also getting jacked like, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> and then like i guess finally took it to some vet and and they asked right away, like you wouldn't happen to take any hormones or anything like that and she was like oh my god yeah i take testosterone i rub this cream on he goes oh yeah it's the cream is rubbing off on your you imagine you're holding your baby you know and you uh, even know you're like, yeah. dude, my my uh, my six month old is jacked. He's got crazy <laughs> genetics. Yeah. I mean, I've never been a fan of the, the 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 cream. Anyways, I would rather do. I know, but some people have like an issue with the the needle and stuff like that. But yeah. It isn't al almost everything is better that way, yep. right? Yeah. I mean, I like the, uh, people. It's convenience. That's why they like the yeah. the cream. Right. It's just pure convenience, and they're they're afraid, whatever you know, yeah. afraid or or apprehensive of using a needle. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, there's um there's a dopamine effect from testosterone. So um and some people are sensitive to that. Um, especially in, in, typically women, when they'll take testosterone, they get this kind of dopamine burst and it can make them feel a little, wow, like this is, this is kind of wild or crazy or whatever, well, but it depends on the individual. Speaking of women and hormones and all that stuff like um, that, I was talking, uh, I share this with Doug and, and, and Justin, cause I haven't heard this yet. So I'm talking to Sal yesterday or the day before, and we're, we're talking about, you know, period cycles and things like that and hormonal changes with that. And he's, uh, he's like, Oh man, no, you know, I've got, I've got two in the house now. Right. Talking about his, his daughter. <laughs> yeah. He's like, bro, you, you fucking believe what she said to me driving today to school. She goes, I said, I'm just driving to school. And she goes, why do you breathe like that? Yeah, dude. <laughs> Why do you breathe? Bro. Why do you make those noises? Dude. I died laughing <laughs> because I am very like familiar Doug's, with Sal's breathing and noises. Doug's and the smiling because he knows. <laughs> oh, dude. Like she wakes up in the morning. Uh, it, first of why all, do you breathe like that? Bro, it's, it's microclimates. Like, hey, I'm happy. Two seconds later, what is going on right now? Just oh, yeah. finds that thing. You know, yeah, right, right, like, right, right to the dude, core, bro. Dude, like, boom. Yeah. Like, stop. Like, like stop something it. you can't control at all, you know. No, I no, was I, telling Katrina the story last night, and she hilarious. asked me, "What did Sal say?" I was like, "You know, I don't think you told me. What did you? How did you respond to her when she said that?" I said, "I said that's how I breathe, honey." I said, "You need to relax. <laughs> don't give me attitude." No, I mean it's everything. We're driving, and she's like, "She's like, Ugh. she makes it sound that's like what?" Really she's annoying. Like, the way you're breathing, I'm like, "What?" The way I'm breathing. Oh yeah, dude, I got. <laughs> oh, man. I, I can got, stop breathing, breathing for you, honey. Yeah, yeah, I got, I got the teenage daughter and postpartum wife at home. So basically, it's what did I do wrong now? That's my that's the game that we play <laughs> when I walk in the house. What did I do wrong, everybody? That's why what I stopped, I bro. <laughs> I know, it's Two boys, time. I got. No, but I you know what? Lucky. You get the flip side too. Like she's, she'll be so loving and so. And I love my daughter. She's 
she's like she's she's a she's a lot like me in just female form but a lot like me. she's super ambitious super whatever but it's funny to see this and then later she apologized oh sorry dad i wasn't i was uh kind of you know, snappy at you or whatever, which is pretty good. That's pretty self-aware for a 13 year old. That, yeah, is, that, that is, she's already like caught on to that. That's wild. Dude, you got to see though, man. Her, and she doesn't do this with me, but you know, you know what they say about daughters and their moms? Like when daughters become teenagers, like the blowouts that they'll get with their moms oh, yeah. is amazing. I've heard it's, yeah, it can get epic with uh, epic. the moms. Yeah. Oh yeah. It doesn't happen at home with me, but I hear stories about it happens with my them, sister with and my mom were like that. Really? For, oh yeah. Like still to this day, actually, like I can't talk to my mom the way my sister can. And I mean, and it's not just like a respect thing because I'm a man and it's my mom. And so I don't want to ever like disrespect her that way. But like when we were kids, like if I back talk my mom, my mom will haul off and slap me upside the head, like right away or elevate like the yelling yeah. with me. And so and to this day, like if we get into it, you she'll e she'll escalate, <laughs> she'll escalate really quick, and then I just gotta kind of like okay, you know, or yeah. just let's leave this alone. Where my sister will go, like you know, what is it about toe to toe throttle, with throttle her down? And, yeah, what is it about that? Is it just because they're both girls and they? So that's what I attribute. Like obviously, uh, if no matter how much my mom escalates it, I'm never gonna take it physical or go beyond because I'm a man, right? So I'm not gonna do that. But my sisters were like, did "Let's you, go." Did yeah. you know that? <laughs> Let's go, bitch. <laughs> you, okay, so here's this is what's this is interesting. You know what this uh, reminds me of? You, I want you to fact check me, Doug, because I want to make sure I'm accurate. Did you guys know the domestic abuse rate is highest? Is um, is among some of the highest rates in same sex couples when they're both women. I've heard that. Did you know that? I have. They have some that. of the highest physical abuse rates when it's two women. It's interesting. Yeah, and I and I'm, I'm trying to speculate. You know, I, I remember reading this. Maybe Doug can look this up. And I, I I think it might be because there isn't so much of a maybe social. It's not so socially acceptable for girls to hit. I mean, it's socially unacceptable. But definitely, if a guy hits a girl, totally socially acceptable. Two guys hitting each other, maybe there's the risk of real danger and damage. So it's like, we're not going to do this. Whereas maybe girls think like, we can do this or, or whatever. I don't know. It's interesting. What does that say? 43.8% of lesbian women and 61.1% of bisexual women have experienced rape, physical violence, and are stalking by an intimate partner at some point in their lifetime, as opposed to 35% of heterosexual wow. women. That's a big difference. Yeah, almost. Yeah, that's a that's lot. That's 10 to 15% wow. higher. Yeah, I wonder why. Crazy. I, I like I, th I I'm thinking. I, well, I'm there's probably a lot of factors, right? So a lesbian couple, I you would assume that the 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 women have a lot of masculine traits. With a with a gay guy couple, they have more feminine uh, feminine traits, and so they're less likely to probably be aggro. I don't and, know. Because each other. Like the role split a lot of times. No, yeah, but even when they're split like that, you still like you, two two gay guys that are that are you know one of them's more more masculine the other still have feminine still have a lot of yeah, feminine traits in comparison to a heterosexual man. I don't no? know if I agree with that because really I, I think it's more yeah. I think it's this. It's, and it's that has to be a well, let me put it way. Let me put it yeah. this way. It's it's more it's much more socially acceptable for a woman to hit a guy, right? For sure. And much more socially acceptable for a woman to hit a woman. A guy hitting a woman, definitely, like, that's a huge no-no, no, -no, no yeah. matter what. Even if she's coming after you. If well, you that's could, imprinted on us at very young age. Right. So. And then two guys, here's the deal. A lot of people don't know this, especially women. When t And guys have experienced this, by the way. If you're, you ever do this where you're out with your girlfriend and some dude does something stupid, cuts you off or whatever, and then she starts mouthing off and you're looking at her like, you do realize that. Yeah, there's consequences. Th that if, if she goes down, I'm gonna be the one. Yeah, that's yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. We're so, usually the fall guy, for right? Me. So I'm wondering if if it's because the guys, the men know, like, if we if this goes down, <laughs> this it's is gonna, gonna get physical, and it's gonna get really bad and really ugly potentially. Maybe yeah. that's why. I don't know, but I find that a very interesting statistic. Did you guys, did you guys see those clips I sent you of uh, of what's her face? Uh, I think Jebediah, I think is her name. The girl, the two clips I sent over. To I you did see that. Yeah, it's whew, hard. That's uh, off of um, Value Tainment, Patrick Bet David's. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I did. Watch I, that. I think he he brought her on underneath the Value Tainment umbrella, and like she now works for the company, and she has her own podcast, and like that she goes hard. That's interesting. Yeah, she, she goes real hard. Yeah, it's definitely kind of a counter cultural message out there. She's well, especially pretty, coming from another yeah. woman too. Like just some of the stuff that she addresses is. Did like, you know that uh, I read this the other day? Statistic that eighty percent of divorces are initiated by the wife. That's so majority are initiated by the wife. And did you know that the divorce rate is significantly higher hmm. when the husband earns less than the wife? 
So those those are two very interesting. Yeah, it's these interesting roles that like it's it's one that gets kind of uh, convoluted. It seems that um, I don't know. We we fall back on roles a lot of times, and and it's interesting to see who was it that made that that point. We keep trying to change it. Strip us of everything. No money. No social content, and just throw us on an island. See what happens. And like naturally, like these these gender roles that we're 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 trying to disrupt and change. Like everyone will kind of naturally fall right into that, even in in an island like that. And that doesn't mean there's not anomalies in each category. It doesn't mean there's not going to be well, a, a one of the one of the girls is going to be like a badass hunter and she's going to go hunt with some of the guys. And it doesn't mean there's not going to be a dude that's really good at gathering and shit that's not going to stay back and gather. It just means a bulk, a majority will naturally go into well, gender I, roles. I think the key is that that people should be uh, not ostracized for as long as they're not hurting anybody and they're good people or whatever to live and organize their families however they want. So I right. agree with that. However, the flip side of that is I think sometimes it pushes people against what may work for them because mm-hmm. they think, oh, I don't want to do this, you know, traditional thing. When in reality, that might be what works best. That might be what you like. You know, so, I, it's, it's so a, I think let's well, like basically yeah, do, you do what keep works an best. keep an open mind even for maybe old values. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. That's I don't, what I mean. I don't yeah. know where I, uh, so I, you, this is an interesting dynamic that we have, that Katrina and I have to, have had to work through because of her upbringing was so, um, her mom raised her to be such an independent woman and need no man and always keep some yeah. money aside for herself and like just, and so that has been this, and then now that we've had this kid now and and we're, we're building this family together and there's certain things that I need her help in and, and vice versa, there's been this kind of muddied area of, you know, the, not like falling into a gender role type of deal that, and it's, and she was presented such a counter message growing up that I'm just like, it's not a bad thing for you to do this. It's right. not, you're not less no. because I'm asking you to stay home and do these things or do that. It's like, it's not at all like that. It's just that. And if, if, for, if you were the one that was going out and, and making more money for us, then it would make sense, I guess, for me to go over here and do this. It's just, it's not, why does it have to turn into this thing where it's like, well, there's, a, there's another piece of that too, which is, um, you know, like the going into something with the idea and thought, like if this doesn't work, I better protect myself. And there's a downside to that. There's definitely a downside yeah, to that, which is look, when you go into a marriage or a relationship, you have to, I think for success to really, the best chances for success, you have to make yourself vulnerable. Like it's it's like this, it's like, don't mm-hmm. love someone fully just in case they cheat on you or don't date anybody because they may- You have like an insurance policy right yeah, away. Yeah, but, but then you miss out. Like yeah. you miss out on the opportunity for this to maybe be, be a thing. Like, you know how many married couples- a lot of married couples have their own bank accounts. You have your money. I have money, my money. And I get where that comes from, but I feel like you, you, you got to go all in for this potential to really work the way it's going to work. And yes, that increases the potential risk of, you know, well, but, and I get that, but it's, however it's, you structure it needs to be communicated like, like extensively uh, before really kind of going and taking this obviously, but I think it's just where the problem lies is where those roles start to kind of bleed together. And it's like, you need definitively separate, um, you know, divide and conquer. That's just the mentality. It's just efficiency in, yeah. in your household. Doesn't matter what it is. You got to agree to it and, and structure it accordingly for it to work. Otherwise it's a competitive And that's my point. Environment. My, my point is it's like that running like, a business. And yeah, it's but exactly. the, the thing is when you, when you get this messaging from as a child, so hard. Yeah. Like you're almost like you're the lesser because yeah. You're, and yeah. it's like, it's, it's, it's like, okay, here we are building this thing together and it makes obvious sense. You should go do this and I should go do that because it just, it's like, it's like, it's just like running a business or running a sport team. It's like, you're great at rebounding the ball. I'm great at passing the ball. So there's no reason for you to try and be the best passer on the team. Go be the best rebounder. I'm going to be the best passer together. We're going to win. Especially if it comes naturally, right? But this idea of like, you shouldn't be a sinner. That's you should be. You should be whatever you want. Yeah. Be a point. It's just like you should, okay. we should all be the lead singer. You know, even though you're the best <laughs> yes, drummer. You're it's the like, best. Yeah, yeah. right. So then, then it gets it gets complicated when you get in these 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 situations where. Well, I mean, it's what's interesting to me. This is true. I'm going to be very objective here. Of all the things of, of the family, you have a family. So you have kids, husband and wife, or whatever, right? Or you know, couple, couple, children. The most important 
thing I could possibly think about in that, and that all the stuff that has, that goes into running that, right? You have a house, you got to pay the bills, you got to earn money. That's what we teach our children. Is who is with the kids right. and who is raising yeah. my kids. The most important thing. I give up, I would give up money for that. You know what I mean? I'd rather be struggling with money, but you know, working and do, but have my kids be raised right than us make a ton of money and my kids be raised by other people who I don't like yeah, or otherwise don't trust somebody or, else is going to raise them. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or social media is going to raise them yeah. or something else. So it's one of the most important roles. I, I mean, I feel like some of the, the, the two biggest, and we know this by I think the way, the two biggest terrible messages that have been presented to our society is the, the Peter Pan thing for the men and the boss bitch shit for women. Yeah. The, the, and, and yep. whether, whether you can make a case that they're, they're rooted in like good intentions or whatever, yeah, there's but, a little bit of truth in it. Right. And, and that's what I'm saying is I'm not saying that it's, there's all bad to that, or there's not some value to some of the things that, that are wrapped in it. But I really think that we, we, we went extreme on both of those. And I think both of them have been detrimental to mm -hmm. the, to the family unit. Yeah. And this, especially it, if it's a partnership. Yes. I, I, it's, it's so weird to me that we don't look at relationships more like that instead of it being like this competitive thing yeah. of like, why can't I chase my job? Why can't I do this? Or yeah. why, why are you, you have holding to do this? Me or back? Why do you have to be? That? It's it, like, you know, I mean, we didn't we join together to to create a, as one and then build a team. And then just like you would build a business or build a, a sport team to be very successful, we would evaluate you know, who is better at certain things. And it's not like, oh, I'm better. You're less. It's I'm really good at this. You're really good at that. Like, go. Let's it's go. also it's also there's other yep. there's other uh, side effects, negative side effects of this, which is part of that message is men and women are the same. Okay, like uh, I think we should be respected the same. I think we should be treated by the law the same. First of all, no two individuals are the same, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, men and women are different. And I think if you accept that, that maybe your spouse doesn't communicate or hear things or listen to things the same as you, you'll be able to communicate better with them. Like for example, mm -hmm. when my wife comes to me with a problem, 90% of the time, she does not want me to provide her a solution. Now, when I provide a problem to somebody or to my wife, 90% of the time, I want a solution. Give me an idea. Totally different. In fact, I fuck that up all the time. She'll come to me and talk about something and I'll be like, well, why don't you try this? And she's like, you're not hearing me. Like, I just want you to be like, to understand. And I'll be like, oh yeah, that's what right. you, you know, totally want or whatever. Yeah. Or like, you know, if, 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 uh, and I know a lot of men like this, they'll go to work and if the wife is like, oh, my husband is working a lot, instead of telling him, don't go to work so much, say this to him, try this out, say this to your husband. You're such a, God, you work so hard for your family. You care about it so much. Go out there and do it. You know what's going to happen? Freddie's going to go kick ass and to come home early because you don't want to be with his family. Mm -hmm. So it's very, so if you want to learn how to, and by the way, this isn't just men and women. This is also uh, individuals. Everybody's different. So you got to kind of figure this out. And I think what happened is it, 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 like, it made people feel bad for, you know, being certain ways or wanting to be communicated in certain ways because like, oh, well, this is stereotype. Like forget right. that, you know, drop that shit. Anyway, cracks me up. No. Uh, Adam, I want to hear about the Crocs that you were that you were going to buy. Because <laughs> I heard you say that you were going to wear. You're going to be a Croc guy I now? can't imagine you wearing Crocs. I am, I am fighting it with every. What every, is making you want to buy Crocs? So I, I put a pair on. So I was. <laughs> uh, when we went. You're up, getting old, bro. When we were, when we were up at. So uh, when we were up at Truckee last with all the family, my nephew, who's in high school, uh, who wears the same size shoe as I do had a pair that were out and I was going in and out of the garage. And so I slid in them real quick and I got to admit, like I slid <laughs> in them. I went, went oh, well, this is kind of nice. He had like, he had the, Crocs. Like the furry inside yeah, they ones. Had the, fur, the furry inside. And I was like, they were comfortable and warm and, and just don't worm around anyone. Nobody sees them. Okay. So that's, so that's <laughs> oh, why Katrina's man. like, no, you're not getting those. And I'm like, <laughs> you, I'm not going to no wear them. In, I said, I'm not going to wear them in public, hon. Come on. Too much of a shoe guy. Too much of a shoe guy to wear them in public with an outfit. Right. What I, what I do have though. And I don't know if you guys like, cause I think everyone here is shoe off guys in the house, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah you sho you're all shoe off. Yeah. So we're all shoe off guys in the house. So when I go out, uh, I actually have a pair of like old sneakers at every exit. So my garage, mm -hmm. my front door, and my backyard. That way you can just go outside. That way I can, just, from my, I can just slide my shoe. But they're always like shoes. And so I'm uh, smashing them or they're yeah. like all the back, the heels all compressed. I do have one pair of Birkenstocks that I keep on the garage for taking out the trash. I don't. And then my, my other ones are sneakers. And so I actually want them 
for exactly that. Just so when I, eight o'clock at night, I gotta go take the trash out, I'm walking out the door, yeah. I can just slide my feet in those comfortable suckers and walk out to the trash. So I mean, I can't talk too much shit because I do have moccasin uh, slippers. <laughs> you do. <laughs> moccasins and are you guys, you made fun of me for that already. You but do. Dude, yeah, I have those for that same exact reason, though. I have it near the door and I'll go get the trash or I'll, you know, take the dogs out or whatever. Just like, so that way I don't have to like make a whole ordeal about putting my shoes yeah. on. But I like, I like Crocs. Just, I, I like just know. big fluffy it's big step. socks. That's what I do. I just like outside. Stuff. No, no, inside the house. Oh, yeah. Well, no, I'm talking thing. about when you yeah. walk outside. So yeah. that's, I do the same thing as I just have have uh shoes that i just smash that's what you, do. Foot you do right you smash yeah. them so that's kind of how i feel i'm like okay oh, that or i can get a pair of these yeah, someone might see you walk outside bro <laughs> i know <laughs> if, 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 you saw what I, if you saw what i look like walking internet. the dogs or walking the trash i do not look put together whatsoever you know what i'm saying i look like i'm in my well, i'm gonna buy those little pins that you put in the holes right <laughs> the, 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 those are cool decorate it those for are kind of cool i actually that's I another to get you now i wanted to get them for my my son because i think that's kind of cool what the kids do with all the like the little whatever charms or whatever they put inside of them i'm like yeah my well there's a reason why they've been around for so long it's because they're because they're super comfortable yeah and they're cheap too they're not expensive really yeah like 40 bucks you can oh, get, a, okay. you get a pair bad. of them so like they're yeah i'm not i'm not a i'm not a fan of like you know like wearing them with an outfit i just don't mm. see they don't seem to go well get katrina to some jellies <laughs> yeah. remember jelly oh, like the same crap. thing uh, is it like the same thing as crocs are just like crap no make your feet sweat like crazy and everything mm. you guys remember inflatable furniture wasn't that a thing for a second in the 90s like real inflatable, inflatable? Furniture? you don't remember that like some kids would have like purple or whatever and it was like inflated like pieces of furniture in the room you guys don't remember that no no really I mean, not no. like real furniture. i remember like no yeah. it wasn't like you, you don't have no. it in your living room it was, oh like, kids oh, will have it in oh, room. Okay. that well, reminds me of that cool yeah, historical right. fact though of like world war ii where they had those inflatable tanks yes and, and to scare uh, the yeah i was like the most brilliant thing that uh, oh, I saw that. It was on that history Instagram, huh? Yeah, they, they just that. move on, but it made it look like they had all of this. Dude, like, have you guys ever read about the crazy plans that they had during World War II to try to, you know, fight the opponent? Like all these, because it was like, you know, it was a crazy war. Yeah. And they came up with some of the craziest, like, ideas ever. Like one of them was to strap bombs onto dolphins <laughs> and get dolphins to swim to ships and blow up. Yeah. That was one. Another one was to attach incendiary like small incendiary explosives to bats they almost did this by the way in japan and they would launch these bats over big cities and because japan at the time had lots of those you know the japanese style architecture with the overhangs or whatever yeah that they would let go of the bats have these timed little mini explosives the bats would fly under the overhangs and then at you know the right moment they'd set fire to everything I feel like that's terrible. I feel like they were just in a room with a bunch of comic books. And they were like, what <laughs> yeah. the fuck? What are we going to do? Totally. <laughs> like, let's come up with some Dude, crazy ideas. All right. You guys want to hear a crazy, a crazy st uh, fact or whatever statistic. I just looked this up. Don't ask me why I looked it up, by the way. I look up weird, <laughs> okay. weird shit. You guys want to know what the, I was, okay. So you know how a black hole in the universe, the gravitational pull is so powerful that not even light can escape it, right? It's so powerful that it sucks in light and then that's it. You don't see you don't see it come out. Okay. okay. So is the center of each galaxy a black hole? I Did they so. confirm that? I believe so. Okay. So do you want to know what the mass of a black hole is? To have that kind of gravity? Because mass gives gravity, right? Yeah. So the sun is massive and so powerful that the entire solar system revolves around the sun. That's how powerful the gravity is right. of the sun. Okay. The mass of a black hole is 4.385 times 10 to the 30th power in pounds. In other words, the, a black hole is has the mass of 20 billion suns, all condensed into one point. It's just super dense. Super crazy dense. What? Isn't like it makes wild? no sense. Isn't that wild? Because is it, yeah, because you think of space as being this big vacuum, like emptiness. No, but there is a a a, a part of the universe, maybe Doug can look this up, where we found this part of the universe because we have an observable universe that is a vacuum. There's nothing in it and they don't know why there's what? nothing in it. Yeah, maybe Doug can find it like a, a you, large vacuum in space with no stars, no nothing. And they don't know why it's empty. It's like this one So big this dark matter, I mean, and, and this is something they've speculated, if they could harness sort of the energy from it, like have they 
made any breakthroughs with that fusion Did yeah, you guys I, read this yeah I wanted that? to bring that up I, I didn't get to read the article okay. but I know so I wrote down this quote because I don't think people realize how insane this is well so I saw the, the interview with uh, Neil deGrasse like I saw that he that, you, you yeah, he didn't one. even yeah. bring it up on, on Rogan so this just happened just after oh, that oh it happened after that it just happened I mean this, I mean, this is this I was listen. like weeks ago yeah. yeah okay so fusion promises to to give us essentially limitless energy Okay. Now, what would that mean for humanity? Everything. Yeah. yeah. It changes Everything. Our, the entire structure of society. Well, what right? pr what what carbon uh, based energies like oil did to humanity? If you look at the population of Earth when we started using oil and stuff like that, it's like exploded because now we have energy. We can power things. We can heat things. We can create machines, and just it became obviously just this huge boom. All right. So check this out with what they did. They didn't even. They didn't achieve break even. In other words, break even would be we put in so much energy and it gives us so much energy back, which is by by itself would be amazing because the way that energy works, you put in energy, some is lost. Yep. So you only get. You're not going to get all of it back. They didn't. They didn't do that. They got more energy out than they put in. What? So they put in so much energy and got more out. Yeah. So that is that is literally like. And supposedly the hardest part is done, right? Like the actually yeah. figuring that out. Now it's like up to the engineers and stuff like that on how they to make it like and do. Yeah, how do you make it into an engine for a car? Yeah, now? applicable. How do you, and how do you use it, it to? It. Yeah, how do you now use it? Yeah, how do you harness it? How do you use it now to power a city? But the the science but has been. This is where out. we need to completely put our focus, right? Because that would solve the majority of, all, especially this climate hysteria. That would make us interstellar. That would make humanity. We would no longer be bound by any of our previous yeah. boundaries. What are we going to fight over? I mean, after that uh, takes over, well, we'll find something. I yeah, know we'll find something, but <laughs> I mean, it's like in terms of like conflict with countries and like it, a lot of it is over resources well, the, and energy. Or, here's the, the most fear: part. the fear is that the first country to do this in a practical way, if the first country to 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 get fusion to the point where it's practical instantly becomes the world superpower by far yeah. instantly. It's oh, just yeah. so annoying. Cause like, that's just something like you're like, what's the, why, why would we want to keep that to ourselves? Or like, you know, like that would just be something that just naturally every country should just have it. Yeah. Human behavior. I know. I it's know. like, <laughs> so, I mean, well, and then there's it's going to turn into yeah, that. But isn't that fear that somebody's going to harness it for bad too. Right. So that's part of why you don't want to, you wouldn't want to. Yeah. What share. kind of super weapon could be created with it? Yeah. Well, right. what it is, that's, is it, here's the fear. The fear isn't that we death have ray. limitless energy. The fear is that we have different ideologies. Yeah. And the and opposing ideologies. Yeah, and what could and, somebody and, do with that? Right. So if you have like let's say China, whose ideology is uh, pretty much on the opposite end of the spectrum to let's say Western ideology or American ideology, whoever gets that, um, that's not necessarily a good thing because they're going to want to impose it on the other on the other side. Mm. So I mean, but like I said, like this could. This is a crazy breakthrough. Now we're probably decades away from this being. This is the next that's... race, though. I mean, I thought I thought it was going to be over AI, which obviously is still a big push in a lot of countries, especially China. Yeah. Well, but... you brought that up. You uh, the actually two things. One, before I move on and move to what you just said with that AI, did I did I ask you guys the trivia on? Do you guys know how many Earths will fit in a sun? How many Earths? Yeah, a million. Yeah, yeah. a million Earths. Yeah, one Oof. million. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's a that's sun's, it's sun's massive. Big. It's big. That's massive. Everybody asked that you must. I must have asked you. I you forgot. Did. By the way, one of the first people to speculate that other stars may be suns was executed. This is, <laughs> of course, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Hang him. How <laughs> messed up is that? <laughs> you know, the other stars might be suns. Kill him. Kill him. You, yeah. uh, so the, where I was in transition Earth with the AI round. talk. So you know our, our our young buck that we shouted out the other day, the look like you lift guy. Yeah. Did you see him responding to all the hoopla around the chat CP, chat GPT one? No, what? So uh, it's spitting off workouts. Oh yeah, I did see that. What? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I guess it's stirred workouts, up all. It's and the workouts pretty good. Aren't bad. Yeah, supposedly they're pretty good. <laughs> they're not bad. We're gonna put us out of our, our job. No, it's not yeah. that good yet. No, it's not <laughs> that good. But it ain't maps quality. But yeah. they're better than. Okay, now here's why they're better than most workouts on the internet. Because yeah. most workouts on the internet are so <laughs> shitty. Yeah, yeah. 
that, that they're not science based. That's right. That's yeah, why yeah, that's they're right. not science based at all. And so it didn't take much for an AI no. to like write some somewhat science based like well, programming. Well, because it's basic. And it it's basically put ninety percent of the influencers out of business. Yeah, it's yeah. literally compound lifts, basic lifts. And shreds you know. was just getting going again. Well, so so my I mean, son, he, he had a great take on it. So if you haven't watched a little clip on it, and I agree with him, right? Away, I think I put on another great take because Bro, I agree. My, my son went on there. He went on the uh, what is it called? The chat, chat GPT. Chat GPT. He went on there and he asked it to write him a term paper. And I don't remember what this, the specif specifications were, Yeah, but it was complicated, like a term paper in the, you know, during this time era discussing this, uh, you know, debating this particular issue, like this really spit out a term paper right away. And he goes, dad, he goes, this, what are they going to do? We're how are they going to, how are they going to police this? They can't. Yeah, in schools and stuff. It's, it's totally disruptive. Like, it's I, I used it too. So now it was like blew my mind what it like produced almost instantaneously. Okay, so what's what now? Okay, to to this right here. Okay, now if five students cued it the same thing, would it respond the same way to all five? Okay, we should test that. Yeah. We should ask it the same because question that and that's see if we where this will answer. be quickly. You know when. The, the whole classroom shows up with the yeah. text and it's, it's like, like, wait a minute. Pretty I, obvious, right? I feel like I've read this. But if this thing like spits you out something unique every time, like how are they going to track that? But I would imagine that if you ask the exact same specific question that it's going to spit off the same term paper or answer. No. Uh, yeah. You, I don't, you just, yeah, you'd think. I mean, if it's single, if it's single answers to stuff where there's an objective answer. Obviously. Have, yeah. yeah. Obviously. But two paper, plus two is always going to be four, no matter how right. many times you ask it. But, but a paper with specific parameters, like, or even you're like, right. yeah, I mean, you would think that it would probably spit off the same, you're right. same concept. So if you're a kid though, now I'm hmm. thinking as a student, how would I do this? So I wouldn't get caught. I would try and make it unique the way I'd ask the question. So like, let's say that- like Yeah, but like, okay, let's let's use the term paper. You know, 30 kids are doing it. How many, could you come up with that exact term paper with 30 different cues? Probably I mean, not. Maybe, I mean, maybe a couple, maybe a couple, you could you could say a little bit different, but then you, you get too different and you're not going to get what you want from it, right? Yeah, I don't mm. know. I tell you what though, this technology they're saying, my cousin told me, he's in the, he's in this whole space. He's, uh, he actually helped found some big tech companies and he's got a company right now that he's working on. He's going to be a billionaire. This is a family member of mine. I'm like, for sure, his kid's going to be a big billionaire, smart dude. He said, Sal, he goes, this will do to the world what the internet did. He goes, that's how big this oh, is. Oh, I mean, I see that. Yeah. I see that already. I mean, look at just the fact, I mean, I told you guys off offline, I, there was a picture of uh, us from the event that we had, and I was going to write a caption about <laughs> yeah. partnership and friendship. You had it write it for us. Yeah, and so I was like, let me see what this thing could do, right? Because I knew kind of what I wanted to say or whatever like that, but I knew that would actually yeah. take me, you know, 15, 20 minutes, especially me as slow as I write. And so I'm like, let me cue it in there. And it spit me off something that would, was better than I would have wrote myself. And I was like, damn. <laughs> That's such a trip. It was So I first I cued it. Like, uh, write me an Instagram post that is, uh, you know, related to partnership that and talks friendship. about partners. Yeah. And it literally gave me like a witty short caption with hashtags is what it gave me. And then I was like, Oh, I want to write something longer. So I said, write me a paragraph about friendship and partnership. And then it gave me this law and both of them were fine. Now was it, was it, was the, the verbiage the same or was it different? Totally different. One was a, one was a, a one was a witty what the fuck? one sentence caption. One of them was like a witty one sentence sentence caption with hashtags. The other one was a drawn so out. Let paragraph. me ask you guys this question then, okay? Um, entertainment. What what's going to prevent when they can get to the point when they can digitize a character, okay, where it looks real because they're getting close to this. It looks real, and they can literally make the character as likable as possible for whatever they're looking for, and then this technology makes it talk. And it's got a personality and it's debating and it's entertaining and mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. Like, are yeah. people even going to do that anymore? It's are like they artificial entities. Yeah. I like, mean. They're almost like their own little life forms. Yeah. What's the, God, that's going to be a weird future. I mean, tell me we're not moving faster and faster to the plugged in and unplugged division in our, yeah, in our society. Because, and, and things like this are only making the case and the argument for the plugged in people that it's going to be great. And it's, oh, we're going to be able to make yeah. AI movies and we're going to have friend. I'll be able to create a friend digitally you know how, that is like, you like know the most awesome supportive friend you no. could have. You know how ignorant people yeah. are though when they're like, oh, imagine a future where you don't have to work. 
You don't have to worry about anything. Everything's done for you. And I'm like, you yeah, better. What, what's going to get you up in the morning? You, yes. You better have some kind of a practice, a discipline, a spiritual practice. Cause you will, that is hell. You yeah. will be stuck in hell. You won't, you'll be great for six months. And after That's that, why I love be, that. I mean, you haven't brought it up in a long time. You used to bring it up all the time. That, uh, twilight zone episode. I just oh, yeah. think it's such a, uh, such a great uh, metaphor for, for that is that we think, we want everything, but you be surprised. I mean, and how many times have you heard that story? I mean, I've shared that story. You think that the answer is, oh, if I had everything or I have all this money or I get all this and then you get it. And then how depressed is everybody? Because mm -hmm. they, they think so much of it is that. And then you get there and you go, oh, shit. It's yeah. Not. Like how bored would Superman be uh, <laughs> if there was no crime, no villains? And like, would he play sports? He'd be bored as hell. Yeah. Would he do anything, you know, physical? He'd be like, yeah, of course I'm going to win. Like, this sucks. I'm yeah. not going to do this. There's no excitement. There's no fun. There's no challenge. There's no failure. Dude, Mount Everest can be crowded again. <laughs> what? I'm just saying. <laughs> what? <laughs> just, dude, people are going to look for, like, that oh, epiphany and yeah. that. I mean, know. talk about, though, the, uh, you so, know, the the Spartan and the mud, whatever. Like, what a smart business to invest in because, well, that, to me, that's only going to get okay, so you guys, more okay, and more popular. We're going to get deep right now, so I hope you're Yeah, right. well, I mean, that's, you that's do your why we have first. gyms because we don't work in the farms anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, oh, no, actually, we have to mention Seed right now. We're supposed to talk about them. Still, by far, by the way, I have given, I have had, family members try seed who were loyal, loyal to their probiotic. Like I have a, a cousin who's like, dude, I take this one. I've taken it every day for the last five years. Yeah. I don't want to change it. If I don't take it, it'll my, my gut will go off. I'm like, just trust me, try this out. Switched right away. Switched. So he's like, why is it so good? What's, is it different bacteria? So no, I said, it's, it's the, it's how it's delivered. It's literally brings the bacteria where it's supposed to go. You guys aren't on That's the kids one yet, are you? Cause they have the kids one no. too. No, no, I didn't I do that. Yeah, yeah, we have that. We give it to Max. Yeah. Oh really? Uh huh. Is, is it, okay. Yeah, is yeah. it, what is it? it drops? Uh, yeah, I think it's like a drop, a drop. I think you have both options actually. I'll have to ask Katrina. How uh, old do they have to be? Cause I got to give some to my, my two year old. Uh, I don't, I think, I don't know if there's an age limit on it. I don't know. I, there's there probably a, there's probably a dosage different depending okay. on the age. All right. All right. But so here he's obviously old enough to have it. So all right. So let's go. Young. Let's go deep into the. Let's just pretend everybody just smoked a bunch of weed right now. So yeah. check this out. What right. if? So you know the whole like we live in a simulation. We <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> you know the whole like we live in a simulation theory, right? Yeah. yeah. What if humanity reached that point where they solved all the problems? They were super. Everybody's like, this sucks. They're so depressed. So ultimately, the solution was, let's create an artificial reality, plug ourselves in, and make it so we don't know we're in that reality and experience challenges and hardships. Mm. And that's what we keep doing. What if that's what's, what? If that's the deal? So this isn't real? Yeah, like you die and then you wake up. You're like, oh man, fuck, that's, mm. I went through all that. I experienced that. That was really cool. And then you're back to just, you know. You guys got me following that. Anything's possible, bro. <laughs> yeah. that, rabbit hole, that rabbit hole page, that's what the, I was just watching one of their little short videos or clips with all the ominous music and some of that. And the, the, the universe theory, is weird. That's the all theory is that we, uh, you know, why we can't remember anything from ages like one to three or something like that uh, is that that's our memory being wiped clean. And the reason <laughs> wow. why we have- It's making room and for- the reason, Yeah, it's making room for this new life that we're going to live. And the reason why we have deja vu is because there's certain parts that didn't get completely wiped clean. And so that you're, mm. you're, you, you hit, you do something that the previous you had done. Or it's a and fold so, in the space time continuum. Yeah, dude. It's a, <laughs> oh, damn. Yeah. What did I start? <laughs> this is awesome. Hey, so I want to say something real quick. I want to ask you guys your opinion on this because uh, I wish this, this would happen to me because I know what I would do. I was driving by the, uh, the lake. There's a lake over there in Almaden, and I was stopped at the stoplight, and there's geese that are there sometimes. And I'm watching these kids play. And geese you know, geese are, assholes. are aggressive, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. They're assholes. And they're running. And then the people ran away. I was laughing while they're running away. And then I'm like, and it was adults running away from geese. I'm like, you could kick the shit out of a geese. <laughs> yeah. Like if a geese. Those bite you though still. Okay. Yeah. If a geese charged me. Yeah. I, that geese is going down. Oh yeah. I know. So I'm gonna it's actually what? a goose. Goose. My bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If a goose, I don't know why I call this singular goose a geese. Well, if yeah. a goose charged me. <laughs> I feel like I could punt that thing across the. What made you think of this? Because I was watching. I was parked. I was at oh, the like, stoplight. Because they're running away, and people yeah. are running away from the from the geese. Oh, so is your point, them. like just well, how much a bunch of wusses? Yeah, that come yeah. Like, yeah. Stand your ground and give them yeah, a good kick no. in the. You know, <laughs> watch what happens. Oh, we're, we're, about stories, it, we're about as soft as they come, dude. Yeah. I mean, I, I it's it's scary. I mean, you you know that like every generation says that about the previous generation, and but they're right. And they are right. Yeah. They really are. We're we're way softer than our dads and our and our dads were softer than our grandparents. Like 
life is just way easier. The stuff that we consider like hardship and challenges is just like, mm -hmm. oh my God. We're, I mean, I was actually talking about that, that, uh, that limitless thing, um, that uh, what's his name does? Uh, what's the what's the? Oh, boy? you're talking about the series Chris with Chris Helms. Helms yeah, yeah. So I was telling Katrina, like Katrina was like, God, you're all like, why are you all, you know, poo poo in this thing? It's it's a good message, and it's I'm like, yeah, but it's all fabricated. They they hired him after the fact. They already had the message lining. The stuff that we're talking about, we're and I know we're 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 trying to normalize conversations around mental health. I get that and I support that. But boy, are we a bunch of pussies. Mm. I mean, and I I was watching that show right before that I was watching Yellowstone and I'm like and you know they were it was this there was this scene in Yellowstone where you know there's a time of the year where they they run the cattle and it's like a two-week thing mm. and they you don't you don't bring anything you like sleep out on the ground for two weeks out mm -hmm. with your hat, your cowboy hat on. Maybe you got to roll a, a single blanket, but your boots are on, your jeans are on, you're sitting out underneath a tree and that's how you sleep for like mm -hmm. two weeks and hard labor day and night and stuff like that. And guys, are, one of the guys died on the trail. Like, you know, and I'm just like, that was like normal life for everybody. Like you killed a guy. And it was like literally <laughs> normal life. And then the stuff that we, we had to overcome and just get through was like so crazy. And the stuff that we complain well, that, about. That shows you what we're capable of. Right. It really. Well, okay. So let me ask you guys this. Yeah. In 40 years, what will you be bragging to your grandchildren about? Like, what will you say to your kids that we did that they'll be like, not your kids, but your grandkids that we did that they'll be like, you did what? Yeah. Like, what I don't do you think, think we. I don't think there's anything impressive we do. I think there is. Like, what imagine do we do, telling, what do we do that's impressive. So I'm, I, I feel like I'm gonna sit down and tell my great grandkids like, do you know we? Used I to talked on this podcast like eight hours oh, a day yeah. every day. Yeah. For, yeah. <laughs> you had to talk. No, no. I'll be like, you know that we used to get into like five thousand pound machines and just operate them. And sometimes we'd hit each other and die. <laughs> what? You guys did that? That's dangerous. Oh, uh, okay. Something like that. Like, is there anything? Oh, uh, that's a good point. Like, mm. the fact that- I, mean, I feel like they're going to think that's crazy yeah, in the future. No, You I guys operate those that's yourself? A good, that's a good point. You let 16-year-olds do you that? You walked outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's hard to really- it's, It is hard to <laughs> fathom so what- <laughs> what is going to consider what, what people are going to consider to be like? Oh my God, so crazy that we're doing today that in you know fifty years from now they're going to be like, what you guys did that? That's yeah. so dangerous or so. That's a good guess yeah. because when you look at the statistics around like car accident deaths, it's and, crazy. And, yeah, it's and they're going to be like, and wait a minute, when you drove yeah. the car, like. Were you super focused? Nah, we had a radio. We listened to time. <laughs> texting on I'd phones. Eaten there. I didn't even wear my seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, Dad, that's crazy. You're insane. That's a good guess. I can't think of anything else that uh, that is. I I bet you you'll be talking about football. I yeah. bet you you'll be like, we used to play this sport where. Oh yeah. The way you win is you fucking you smash the other guy. What? Yeah, that's crazy. You know, yeah. I bet it'll be something like that. Yeah, yeah that's. A, I don't know, dude. That's a. That's a. That's an interesting thought. If I mean, sports have already evolved so much. I definitely think that uh, sport. There's a very good chance when you see the rise of video game gaming and sports. Yeah. There's a very good chance that it could potentially, in our lifetime, overtake mm -hmm. real sports, and that we will watch like. <laughs> Uh, artists. Honestly, it's like anything physical, right? Yeah, because it will. It'll be then the case they'll make is that it, it's safer, and yeah. you're in your you either either we'll see fake robots that look like real humans that are on a field hitting yeah. each other with with people controlling them, whether that be through their mind or through uh, actual control. But yeah, that the, let them hurt each other and kill each other because we'll be like, you believe that we used to do that? We used to hit each other and take our life expectancy down by 30% and <laughs> Dude, we get injuries. I just feel like every our, our brains are, are going to be even more, like people are going to be so much more concerned because if we're going to find out, because it's like one of the last mysteries of our body really yeah. is like, you know, how the brain works and like how all of these like little micro impacts or physical things affect it. And so it's like, yeah, they could stimulate it by just having a chip or, you know, like have mm -hmm. us look at things virtually. And they're like, I can't believe like you actually, uh, you know, did all these things that like you, you banged your head against uh, somebody else's helmet and like, you know, look, that probably took you like 20% down in your yeah. cognitive speed, and <laughs> like talking shit, you know, like dad, you're <laughs> such a dinosaur. Yeah. I mean, hey, you're right. I actually think that's how, that's 
how you'll get rid of something like that is because well, the the research around and the the the, the statistics on it of, of like how much it declines your cognitive ability, your life expectancy, your your joint health, your injury rate. All they're gonna they're gonna compile all of that, and then we're gonna be able to have real time data that shows like look at what you're yeah. doing. You and used then, to do that in real life. I can yeah. plug into the game now, and I got you know right, and I'm 100 percent safe. Yeah. Did yeah. you guys remember the movie Demolition Man? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how they had sex? Remember? Uh, didn't they simulate it? No, they like plugged in. They had like these helmets on yeah. and they like plug because they're like, you actually touch people, you know, and <laughs> yeah. trade right. fluids. So they had to like plug like, each other ew. in. Yeah, to yeah. Each other. That movie's actually, I mean, it's kind of campy now, but uh, there was a lot of like good predictive stuff. I mean, that. I think player one did the best. I think player yeah. player one's, you know, idea. Yeah, we're kind of closest to that, I would say. Yeah, I, I think that they, they did some of the best as yeah. far as like predicting what we're going to kind of look like. Hey, Doug, we have a giveaway tomorrow, right? When the, the, <clears throat> the day after this show airs, we need to mention right now. Yeah, our... though, so this is on our Instagram account, our Mind Pump Media Instagram account, and it's the uh, 12 days of Christmas that we've been running. Tomorrow's the final day. That's Saturday, mm. and we're giving away a Doc Pro worth a thousand dollars. So a thousand dollars just goes on your bed and heats it and cools it, and you control it with an app on your phone, and it's like a game changer when it comes to sleep. Uh, it's absolutely, like the supercharger version. Absolutely, totally. absolutely love that. In fact, I think where our stuff for the Utah property is is getting there soon too. That's the last one. Isn't it already time. like? Aren't we booking it up? Oh, all, January is almost completely booked already. So, so I, think this have, is for people, I think we have eight or eight or nine days left. So are, for people who know, this is a, a property that's uh, like Park City, right? Uh, Park City, Utah. And in it, we have like all the stuff we talk about. PRX Gym, red light therapy. We have the, you know, Uller systems on the beds, warms and cools them. Cold plunge, uh, cold plunge sauna, sauna, jacuzzi, steam. Yep. And then, of course, your Park City. So skiing and mm -hmm. activities, and it's gorgeous out there. So, so. All the pictures on the, the only thing we don't like, we haven't flown out there when the, so the sauna isn't there yet and the cold plunge isn't there yet. They're getting there. Um, and so, but Doug did take photograph, uh, pictures the last time that we were out there. And it's, is mindpumpparkcity.com? Correct. Mind yeah. So mindpumpparkcity.com. And then you can email Jerry on dates. We've been, anybody who, by the way, too, so I don't know if I've even told you guys this. So if you're a mind pump person and you go through the mindpumpparkcity.com, so we have a, a property management team that we've hired and then Jerry is also managing it from our site. So if you're a mind pump person, we're hooking everybody up that books with a program of their choice. In addition to that, we when you have a mind pump person go, we, we're stocking the house up. So we're doing like the the beef jerky sticks, the element tea stuff, all the Organifi stuff. We're gonna have path waters in the refrigerator. We're gonna have the sponsor hookups. creatures creatures of a habit oatmeal in there. So you'll have access to all that stuff for free when you stay there. So we when we find out if you go through her and you book it, we know you're obviously a mind pump listener. So we kind of give awesome. our, our our people red. All right, now here at the end here, the intro, we give out. Now we've been shouting out pages on social media. There was one you wanted to. Shout I got out? one. Yeah. Ooh, so got one. Um, Chris Williamson. With uh, modern wisdom, so we we interview him coming up here in January, I think, uh, and so I've been and I knew of him before, but obviously since we're interviewing, I'm kind of going down the mm -hmm. the rabbit hole of his content. He is a hell of an interviewer, a hell of an interviewer. Yeah, you were saying yeah, he's great, I've very very a few good. Of his, uh, he's and he's had incredible guests. I mean, he's had every every big guest that you can think of that you probably would want to hear. And he does an incredible job. So I watch him on YouTube, but I know he has uh, the podcast format too. Um, and I th his uh, YouTube channel, I think, is under Modern Wisdom or it's under Chris Williamson. It's one or the other. I can't remember if it's under his name or not. But yeah, definitely a, a good follow uh, if you like those really good interviews like that. Live On is a company that makes supplements that are absorbed better. They reach your target tissues more effectively because they use pharmaceutical-grade liposomal technology. It's a better way to absorb your vitamins and nutrients, critical nutrients for optimal brain, immune, and metabolic health. Go check this company out. Go to liveonlabs.com. That's L-I-V-O-N-L-A-B-S.com forward slash mind pumper. Right now, you can get a free sample pack of all six supplements with any purchase. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Casey from Texas. Hey, Casey, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, so my biggest pet peeve is people that I follow uh, who contradict themselves on advice that I'm trying to uh, gain from them. And so, you know, I came into this whole thing through Mike Matthews, and then he introduced me to you guys, and then I actually hired a coach one-on-one, -on -one, and he isn't crazy 
In fact, he doesn't program at all the compound lifts, like the big ones, military press, bench, squat, and deadlift. And then, you know, I heard you guys talk about how important they were. And then, you know, you had Mike Matthews on and you both were on the compound lift thing. And so I was wondering if I could just read you this coach's opinion and get your direct feedback. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, go for Let's it. Go. <laughs> okay. So look, it's not too long. Right when it feels too long, it ends. I promise. <laughs> All right. So I'm not against programming said. bench, uh, but squat deadlift are quite poor from a hypertrophy standpoint. Far superior options out there place a more direct stimulus on the target muscles without causing a massive disruption like squats and deadlifts. You could stop I there. I only we directly this. program them if the client is A, limited on equipment, B, insists on the list, three, the focus is more on increasing overall strength in the list. Beyond that, I don't see the direct need when you could do a hack squat over a squat or a straight-legged deadlift over conventional deadlift. Those could be considered compounds, but the direct stimulus and fatigue one will experience is much different. Also hesitant on form and technique. They're quite technical, but could also turn into an ego lift. I've had quite a few clients who were persistent that they knew how to execute the lift properly, but ended up getting injured, had to take multiple weeks off. Reason why I try to program dumbbell pressing more than regular bench is because of the range of motion. I think a lot of people get stuck on the idea that you have to squat bench deadlift to get a decent physique. This is far from the truth. I personally haven't deadlifted in two plus years, haven't done a barbell back squat in one and a half years. Legs are still growing, getting stronger. Stimulus is just poor on them. And there's no way I can get under a squat bar for 10 to 20 reps or do a deadlift for that amount of reps. Yeah, Casey, so yeah. You, you literally could have stopped after two sentences. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I tried to interrupt you. Go like, I already know where this yeah. guy's right. so, okay. going to go. Yeah, this is one of the, first off, he's, uh, I don't know who he is, so I don't know his name or, you know, whatever, but I can tell you right now he's an idiot. So, <laughs> so here's the deal. There's, uh, people will look at exercise from a few different ways, and one of them is just the pure hypertrophy standpoint, just muscle building. We don't care about function. We don't care about carryover. We don't care about anything but just. We don't care about learning curve. Yeah, we're just about just we about hard things. Hypertrophy. Okay. For, now, now, if we're just going to argue hypertrophy, I could still make the argument that uh, free weight exercises can outperform a lot of these machine exercises. But even if they were equal, here's where the free weights win. In real life, uh, there's very few leg presses that you're going to do, but you're going to be doing a lot of squatting. There's very little, um, you know, uh, machine rows you're going to do, but there's going to be a lot of barbell type row or deadlifts. You're not going to be doing a machine press in real life. You'll be doing something where you're pressing something over your head. So the carryover to real life is much higher. And the, and as far as uh, and he says I didn't lift. I haven't done these exercises for a year and a half or two years. I bet he did a lot of them when he first started. I bet that's what happened. And once you work out for years and years and years and years, you can get away from a muscle building standpoint to not doing. But I will say this: you will lose this skill and the ability of doing those exercises. I bet if he got under a bar to try to squat his squat now would look terrible or he could potentially uh, injure himself. So yeah, I guess if you're just looking from a stimulate the muscle on its own standpoint, maybe there's, there's equivalency. They're not superior, No, but, no. and I say maybe because I can hear the arguments, but you know, what's funny is that even the best muscle building bodybuilders of all time will tell you the value of free weight exercise. People like Ronnie Coleman, Dorian Yates, uh, you know, uh, Kevin Lavroni, like people who've built, you know, massive physiques, but I don't like to point to bodybuilders all the time because that's such an extreme, you know, endeavor. It would be like pointing to any extreme endeavor in physical athletics and, and trying to get their, you know, specific advice. The average person wants to build a lot of muscle, but would like to also be strong in the real world. And it's not a trade-off. It we're, really isn't a trade-off. We're, we're also, we're also, you're not even addressing, uh, yes, it is better for hypertrophy and I'll make that case for all day long. Okay. Okay, Casey, have you ever have you ever done a a new lift that you've never done before, or do you remember when you first started lifting weights and how much your body responded because it was a new stimulus? It was the first time. Do you remember that that feeling? Yeah, of course. Okay, so you do something like that, and that and what that is is that that's that the it's a novel it's a novel stimulus, and your body has to adapt to it. It's new stimulus, and it goes oh, and it and it and muscle builds. Okay, you do exercises like a leg extension, leg press, hack squat. The body adapts to that really quick and easy because it's fucking easy to do. So you do get benefits from it. You do build some muscle. And then that the curve of the learning curve of it starts to taper down and the adaptation process and the benefits start to diminish. 
The beautiful thing about very high complex movements like the squat, like the deadlift, like the overhead press is it has a long learning curve. And guess what? A long learning curve also equals a longer process of adaptation, which means over time, more muscle. When they do these studies for these knuckleheads that to argue the hypertrophy argument is they're looking at a six week study that shows which one stimulates the muscle on an e-stim machine. Oh, the hack squat fires the quads as much or more than the squat does in a six week setting. But when you look over the course of somebody who trained for two years straight and we took one guy who did nothing but hack squats and another guy who did squats, I guarantee the guy who did squats and not the hack squats versus the guy who did the hack squats and didn't do the squats will have seen more muscle over the course of those two yeah. years. And now the irony I'll too, take that bet all day long. And the irony about the ego lift, first off, uh, here's the irony of that. I've seen more ego lifting on leg presses, yeah. hack yeah. squats, <laughs> machines than I've ever seen with free weights you know I, i've seen people stack the weights on a leg press and do like a two inch you know leg press or whatever so that's funny to me um right. injury risk it can be high on any exercise of course the more complex an exercise is the more careful you need to be with your form and technique that's what makes it high value but man, that's the, the value the, but man the okay. carryover is just so, through the roof yeah so you were talking about functionality versus just muscle growth. And you said, well, I could see the argument of hypertrophy being almost equal. What if your only goal is aesthetics? And no, you're talking about no, it. I we asked the bodybuilder. I disagree. And I know, Adam, you were a, yeah. a pro bodybuilder. But if you ask those guys, I'm like, those are the guys I kind of want to ask. Okay, so, And if they say, yeah, leg press, all that, then why wouldn't I go with that as well? Okay. So I disagree with that, what Sal said. Yeah, by the way, is, I said maybe. Yeah, and, and the reason not. why I said maybe is that's the only argument that they make that I can kind of see the logic. Everything else they say is- what a, Let me tell you something. What am I, and of course, this is my personal experience. Okay, I do not think I have a the genetics to be a bodybuilder. I, I got into that space just to prove that I could build that physique. And I went from amateur to pro with no coach, nobody else, no team, no nothing. And I tell you, one of the things that I think was one of my biggest advantages when I looked at my, because I worked out at a gym where there was probably- 10 to 15 pros at all times were in there. So it was a really cool environment, right? There's a lot, this was in NorCal. I, I worked out at what you would consider like the, um, what's the, the LA one that Gold's every, gym. Yes. So I, that Venice. was, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I had the, the Venice of NorCal, all of us, a bunch of pros and amateurs, a bunch of bodybuilders in there, all of them, which are my friends, all of them, didn't do the movements like squatting and deadlifting and they all trained the machines and cables and trained the pump all the time. I think the reason why my my physique exploded was because I was the guy that was doing that stuff. I thought that was my advantage. My And when I looked at the way they were training, I thought, oh, this is crazy. They're still training all these weak ass movements, chasing the pump all the time. They're missing out on the benefits of training like a power lifter, of training singles, doubles, triples, and getting hitting heavy weight. Now you don't stay there forever because it's important that you phase out of that type of training. That training is tremendous value for your central nervous system and packing on some serious muscle. So these guys that, yes, you could build a physique by, I had a decent physique before I started competing, but it wasn't anything there was like a cap to it. Oh, there was a cap to it. Yeah. yeah that's and, the thing. Mm -hmm. There's this huge systemic effect to these compound lifts that you, they don't consider in terms of like muscle building. So you get a much louder signal, which then, you know, you're going to build this base of muscle like you wouldn't build otherwise if you're just yeah. completely focused on hypertrophy. So yeah, what's so funny, what's funny I to think me too. One, one of the big problems was the fatigue to simulation ratio. I've never really experienced that myself where I go, oh my gosh, I'm so fatigued. I need a deload week. So I don't know. But then I think the other thing was that hypertrophy reps can be from four to 30, right? And so you, Adam, were talking about the different stimulus, right? The different stimuli. Change it up. But what if you're not able to change it up to those higher reps with a big compound list? Are you taking something away there? Or do you do 30 deadlifts? Yeah. Well, well why wouldn't you be able to? Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, do you program 30 deadlifts? Wouldn't that be kind of like a cardio exercise? At well, 30 is a lot. 20, 20 though. Yeah, I typically don't program yeah. anything over 20 reps. 20, 20 reps is 20 reps is, okay. more, is more than And enough. you don't think that's really out of the question or, or strange to be doing 20 deadlifts? No, uh, no it's hard. You're going to have to go real light. Yeah. <laughs> and I do, I do prefer deadlifts in the one to, you know, maybe 12 rep range. Depends right. on the exercise. Some exercises do better with lower reps and, and others with higher reps. Like I don't like to do, you know, rep, sets of two reps with laterals, right? Side laterals, I'm not going to do sets of two. 
but I'll do that with deadlifts. So it depends on the exercise, but no, you can go up to. And by the way, it doesn't reps. mean that neither one of those don't build some muscle. Two reps of lateral raises could build muscle. Yeah, it's just so, the technique is. But really there tough. are certain exercises that lend themselves better with higher rep versus lower rep. Deadlifting happens to be one of those things. I will go all the way up to. I just did, actually just talked on the podcast to the guys. I went all the way down to 135, which for me, I can deadlift over 500 pounds. So 135 is nothing. And I did 20 reps, slow and controlled. It was like just a light day. I was working on technique, the way I pulled off the floor, making sure I was keeping the bar balanced. I love to throw that in there. And I, I am sore as fuck from that because I never do that with deadlifts. So yeah. tremendous value by it, doing it's, that. It's funny when I hear this though, too, because if you look at the just the biggest, strongest people or coaches that coach the biggest, strongest people, and you were to take a consensus, okay? Because you'll get some dissenting views and opinions. But if you take a consensus, it'll be something like 80% will say, yeah, there's tremendous value in the barbell squat and the barbell deadlift and the overhead press. There's tremendous value. Now, in athletics, uh, it's that, that there, it would be 100%. Like, you're not going to get a football coach or strength coach that's going to say, yeah, I have my athletes. I don't have my athletes squat. I have them do uh, leg press. Like, you're not going to see very many football coaches say that that's a good idea. But even in just the building your physique, uh, you're still going to see a majority. I mean, look at like uh, who's uh, the Mr. Classic Olympia? Seabum, right? Yeah. Chris Bump said yeah. right? The guy's yeah. been deadlifting and squatting towards the back half of his career and has completely changed his physique and had well, a lot that, of muscle. Well, okay, the reason, Casey, the reason why I get so passionate about this conversation is because I was like you. So my whole like teenage 20 and my 20s, I actually loved hearing this information because I hated to squat. I hated the deadlift and I avoided it for my first 10 years of lifting. And I built an okay physique. Like I didn't look bad. Like I looked good. Like I had a good physique. And when I actually started to deadlift, squat, overhead press, like that was the core of my routine. Holy fuck did my physique respond. I mean, it responded in like a year or two compared to the 10 years I've been doing hack squats and leg presses. And 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 I liked hearing that as a young 20-year-old kid because squatting was hard. I attempted yeah. it and I remember it was hard. I wasn't good at it. I was frustrated. I was weak. Like, And so when I'd hear these bodybuilder guys be like, you don't need to squat. You don't need to deadlift. Those those extra, And then I'd be like, hell yeah, I wanna, I'll want i just mm -hmm. leg press. I'll just hack squat because I like doing that. It's yeah. easy. And so yeah. I fell into that trap. Of, of closing myself that it's a better way to train because I'm a bodybuilder and I care about aesthetics. I don't, I, my saying used to be, Justin will say this all the time, right? Mm -hmm. No, all, I'm all show, no all go. Show, no go. I don't give a shit about how much <laughs> I lift. I don't care about being the strongest guy. I just want to look good. No girl ever asked me when I take my shirt off, how much do you bench? So what do I care about that shit? That was my attitude. And I had a decent physique, but let me tell you, when I started doing those compound lifts and making that my core, Holy yeah. shit, did my physique change. And that awesome. I attribute that to what took me from amateur to pro in such a short period of time is that that was the the, the foundation of my training. And when I looked yeah. at my peers in the space, they just they just neglected that. Yeah, you know the irony That's of this, good. by the way, Casey? Another yeah. Just another piece of irony with this is you'll almost never hear these, you know, quote unquote coaches, you almost never hear them say, you know, free weight curls, are inferior. <laughs> Let's just do machine curls. For some reason, free weights are okay right. for isolation exercises. That'll give you clue. And what, what's the clue here? They just don't like hard work. Yeah. It, they're lazy. Yep. Yeah, squats are hard. Deadlifts are hard. Let's do the easy machine shit. But then when it comes to like curls, yeah, dumbbell curls, barbell curls, those are super awesome. So well, all of a sudden now free weights are okay. Mm -hmm. So, so it, their, their logic is flawed and it's based on, can I do less work? Because this is hard and I've already built a solid physique. And so therefore I can kind of maintain what I'm doing. And it's also, I guess, a counter message these days, which is funny because the, the message was opposite in the past. But now you're seeing people say, oh, free weights are great. So and by the way, the and by up. the way, the risk reward argument is a fair argument. And it and is definitely something as a coach, I apply when I'm talking to a seven year old lady. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking to a 36 year old young fit man right now who I'm like, dude, I do not want you to avoid those movements because some dumbass is telling yeah, you yeah, that but even it with, doesn't have as much benefit look, because I, I fell into that trap. And I wish somebody would have like forced me to squat, deadlift, bench, overhead press when I was younger because right. I have no idea where I'd be today if I would have. Yeah, but look, I trained a lot of old people too, okay? Yeah, I'm not going to have a 70-year-old lady do a barbell squat, but I'm going to have her do a body weight, sit down, stand up squat. And that's yeah. safer than a leg press for her. So this whole like it's you, you modify the exercise. There's, there's a million and one different ways to squat and a million and one different ways to do a press. So it doesn't have to be with the barbell on your back, but that's a fundamental human movement. It's very yeah. strange that people You're would training advocate. The movement. Yeah, don't <laughs> don't train this fundamental human right. movement. Very strange uh, to me. Let's just get the muscles that are uh, that we use with fundamental movements stronger, but let's not practice yeah. the movement. 
as if just getting strong muscles allows you to move well. That's not necessarily well, how Well, you works. stay too long in that, you create dysfunction. Totally. Your, your body doesn't uh, fire the in an ideal way when you actually go to do these types of movements, which sets you up for potential injury down the road. You should so. see, Casey, we have models that come in to film uh, you know, exercises for our programs. And we've had physique competitors come in, and that's how they train with machines. And they can't even perform a standing yeah. full overhead press. Justin has to prime them for yeah, 20 I minutes. 65, 70-year-old guys that can press better than these guys. Yeah, so, and yeah. they can't because they never do. They always use a machine. Right. So, like, just, I don't know about you, but... It's just the patterns they created. I'm not so. trying to lose the ability to lift something over my head straight and, and squat yeah. down on the toilet. <laughs> it's funny because I'm not there yet. You know, like, I haven't graduated to the part where... I'm thinking about functionality and longevity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Adam's point, I think, really drives it home for me in terms of how he changed the game for himself. So Bro, you're 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 in the same place as I was. I, I, like literally that's how I, I thought because and I thought the same way. I did not give a shit about I wasn't talking about yeah. I wasn't talking about functional stuff because I didn't have all kinds of pain. I wasn't talking about performance. I didn't give a shit about how much I did. I just want to look fucking good, bro. Just wanted to look <laughs> and I and I Yeah, but I'm sure I'll get there because honestly, I've will. been doing this for so long and I see myself as Sal says as a, a fitness fanatic and so I'm sure at some point I will graduate to exactly what you guys are talking you about. will yeah you you, yeah. you know what you, you will because father time is undefeated yeah. and eventually you will We're have trying to. to be the voice of reason for you That's yeah, all. yeah. yeah. Are, do you have any of our programs Casey maybe I can send you a program and you can fire that stupid coach <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I do not I do not all right I'm gonna send you I'm gonna send you maps anabolic and I okay. want you to follow the three day a week version on it. And I want you to be consistent with the trigger sessions on the off days. So you are doing something every single day, but the main workouts are three days a week. And I'm looking at you right now and I'm hearing you talk and I bet you're going to put more muscle on with that program than anything that this guy's written for you. Awesome. And then I would okay, I appreciate it guys. Go to that. And then I would love to see you do right after that aesthetic and then split. Like that's like the cool, like, like bodybuilding. That's the next lineup. three. Yeah. Bodybuilding lineup for us as far as programming. If I were to progress you and be training you over the next nine months, yeah. it would be run anabolic, run aesthetic, and then run split. Yeah. We're going to send you anabolic right now. And then make sure when this airs, cause I'm, you know, I'm sure you'll see it. Send this to that coach and be like, Hey, if this annoys you, <laughs> yeah. You should definitely tag Mind Pump and try to make the case. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 I should do that. By the way, it. when yeah. I'm running this stuff, am I in a surplus the whole time? Or You trying to build? Yeah, yeah, right yeah. now I am. Yeah, I would be in a surplus for most of it. Yeah, I like to interrupt that just like every, I don't know, four to six weeks with like a three-day cut for someone like you. If you're really yeah. trying to build aggressively, then just three days of a low-cal low cal for- Every three, four weeks. Or yeah, something yeah. Like that. yeah, that's a nice way to interrupt that and then go right back to your bulk. And then at what point do you fully commit to the cut? Uh, well, it depends how, how high you, you're, yeah, you're yeah. going to allow your body fat percentage. And, That's right. Yeah. You know. keep, put, keep Okay. So you're super uncomfortable and you just know it's well, time. I mean, well, it's, you, you, you can determine that. I don't know if super uncomfortable would be the limit. Maybe just uncomfortable, but it's up to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much. All you right. got it, man. Thanks, Thanks Casey. All right. All right. Got to be one of the most annoying arguments I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. Like, I, I, I hate the like. Bro, it's exactly what I said. It's these, it's lazy. And, and you know what? And the reason why I get so because these this, buff okay, dudes can't. When I squat. got into an argument with Eugene way back when, and this is exactly my argument right here, is okay. He's thirty six, and I'm, he's probably been lifting for a little while already. Is I was the exact same way. I just wanted to look really cool, and so I I paid attention to all these bodybuilder guys, and they basically gave me the free pass that I didn't need to do these hard movements that I that were difficult for me that I hated doing because I sucked at them. And mm -hmm. so I was like, hell yeah, I ain't got to squat, I ain't got to deadlift. Why should I over? I'm a bodybuilder. I'm gonna do all. This. And for years, that's how I trained. And in the real, true reason, deep in my core. Why I avoided it, it when I when I'm being honest with myself is because it was hard, yep. and I know as soon as I said that it resonated with him. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing because you you don't want to do it because you suck you know, and it's difficult. This just reminds me. This is a long time ago. I was 18 years old trainer, and this is when I first became a trainer. And there was another trainer that worked there, and he was this like really jacked, like a kind of bodybuilder type or whatever. And we were talking about working out, and he was relatively young. He was in his early 20s. And he was talking about how much he could leg press. And I said, I bet you, I, we, we had this argument about squats and deadlift and, and leg press. Because I remember when I was real young, that group of powerlifters took me under the wing and taught me how to squat. Mm -hmm. And so we were having this argument, like no leg press. And I'm like, no squat, whatever. And I said, I tell you what, let's go and you show me how much you could leg press for five reps. I'll show you what I could squat for five reps. Let's see who gets closer to the other. And then let's switch. Yeah. And let's switch. 
And uh, needless to say, he hurt himself trying to yeah, squat what course. I squat what I could squat because he didn't have the the skill. He didn't own it. He couldn't do it. He went down, came up. He's like, I hurt my back. I knew I shouldn't squat. And I remember being like, That's embarrassing. My favorite part of this was that you know it, it turns into an ego lift when your point to it being like the leg press being like a super ego. That's lift. come the most on, ego lift, dude. dude. I've seen guys in there like literally taking every single forty five that they can find, and stacking, stacking, stacking their girlfriend <laughs> Just, on there. Like why? And yeah. doing two inch, two inch. Nobody's uh, impressed. Range of motion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's because it's hard, dude. Yeah. It's because it's hard, and that's the the main reason why they they avoid doing it. And Look, listen, I have never ever okay in my career convince somebody to start squatting and deadlifting and then they come back in a year and go like, like that, didn't that, work. that was a waste of my time no. i should have just never every yeah. single time i've actually convinced someone like this to make the switch commit to it get good at the squat and deadlift come back and tell me how you felt as far yeah. as how much muscle you built you know one it. more point i want to make with this is that machines are not designed for you. They're designed for this average body type and you can adjust the seat and do that kind of stuff, but it's always kind of off. Free weights follow you. Mm -hmm. You could be 6'4", you could be 4'4", four, four. you put a barbell on your back, the barbell is stuck to you and you determine the range of motion. You determine how the bar moves. You get, you go, you're outside of 5'9", if you're 6'2", or you're 5'2", and you go do uh, exercise on a machine, the adjustments don't really make it that appropriate for you. It's just a fact. So, Free weights are just superior. And now cables come close. That's the only machine I'd say that comes close where it can kind of follow the individual. But aside from that, uh, free weights are superior. Now there is value in machines. So I'm not going to sit here and say there's no yeah. value. There's definitely value. <clears throat> But for people who say those well, exercises, deadlifts and squats, don't do it. To the dumb. ego thing, it definitely can get away. Like I was on the other end of that spectrum where it was just like everything was about your PR and like what you could literally sure. lift uh, to to the most extreme and put your body through the grind for that without considering like individual like single joint movements at all. Right. Like we would avoid those. Yeah, so that, that too in. has its own flaws. Totally. It could kick in anywhere. Our next caller is Richard from California. What's up, Richard? How can we help you? Hey guys, uh, good to see you. Um, so my question is, uh, I, I'm coming off of a bulk, um, since August and, uh, I, I've been switching back and forth, you know, some bulk, some mini cuts. Uh, but, um, as I go into the new year, I'm going to start a cut. And what I've noticed is that during cut phases, uh, because I'm eating less, um, it's hard to maintain strength and I don't want to lose all the muscle. So my question is in regards to rep ranges. Um, I've been following your program, the anabolic and performance, and um, I've been trying to do, you know, like the five by fives and trying to do like, you know, strength training. Um, but I'm wondering about when I go into a cut, is it better to do like lower weights uh, with more reps or try to maintain the strength? Uh, so I don't lose that much muscle. So that's my question. Yes. What's the optimal range? Yes to both. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah. So it, it, the the same rules apply. Um, that would apply to to when you're in a surplus. Is that you want to cycle through and phase your workouts because your body does get adapted to a specific rep range and it stops becoming uh, or it can start to stop becoming an effective uh, muscle building signal. So in other words, you know, three weeks of five reps. Follow that up with three weeks of 10 reps. Of course, adjust the weight accordingly, right? Um, and then follow that up with three rep, three weeks of 15 reps and then go back to the lower reps. So you want to cycle through and it doesn't matter whether you're cutting or bulking. Now, the only caveat I'll give you is that you really have to deal with the psychological yes. aspect of cutting. You are not going to be able to lift as heavy, even if you don't lose any muscle, just because you have less energy, okay? Because mm -hmm. I'll be weaker uh, when I go on a low calorie diet before I ever lose any muscle at all, just cause I'm just don't have the, the same capacity with energy. So, so keep that in mind. Don't pay attention so much to the weight that you're lifting because it's probably going to go down, but that's not necessarily, it's, it's somewhat expected, somewhat expected. Mm -hmm. So I, that the part that you touched on with the, the psychological part that to me is, this is where the answer lies for the individual, yeah. because Yes, the the truth is both have value. The idea is to always be phasing out of reps no matter where you're at in your diet cycle or whatever like that. But 
I do encourage people to, hey, run MAPS Anabolic Phase 1 and run it some one time through with a bulk, run it another time through a cut, do the same thing in Phase 3, try both ways. And the thing that I want you to pay attention to more than anything else is psychologically what happens to you. Because when you when you are when you when you identify as the strong guy and you mm. really like pushing weight and you're in a cut and you're in a phase where you have to lift heavy sometimes that will fuck people up psychologically and then they end up mm-hmm. doing stupid shit where they load the bar too much they end up hurting themselves or they they screw up on their diet cuz they get they get frustrated cuz they're not they're not they're not seeing the strength gains anymore or they're seeing it go down so how you see yourself react psychologically, I think, is the answer to how you should run during that personally. Okay, mm-hmm. what I have found mm-hmm. is when I when I am in, a, especially when I was competing and I was in a hard cut for a long time, it is inevitable. I almost feel like I'm getting weaker week over week, and that could really right. that could really kind of fuck with you mentally to getting weaker and weaker. So that is when I tend to kind of to taper off of doing a lot of my big lifts where I'm trying to push heavy weight and I focus more on the hypertrophy and the pump and slowing down the tempo. And like, so I start, I love to start playing with things like that where the weight doesn't matter as much. Like if all of a sudden I, you guys hear, hear us talk about do like things like, you know, when's the last time you did like a six second negative or, you know, when did you, when have you done like a, a pause squat or you do like these isometric type of exercise in there? I like to start to incorporate stuff like that in a cut because then it takes me away from like thinking about, man, last week when I was bench pressing, I was doing 225 and now I can only do 180. Like that kind of, that messes with my head. So I try and switch my programming up to things that are less focused on weight, but still are sending a novel novel stimulus to my body. So, I, so it's sending a signal that I, my body wants to build muscle, even though I know it's not going to because mm-hmm. I'm reducing calories. And really, there's no science to support why I do that or why it's better other than the psychological game that I'm playing with myself. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess what I'm hearing is that um, you want to maintain a novelty um, through the cut so that the body is still responding to preserving the muscle and maybe not so much like, Oh, I got a, you know, PR during a cut. Um, I mean, if you can, if you can maintain it, but not hurt yourself, that's, that's great. But, uh, I think most important from what I'm hearing is that just keep it novel, um, throughout that cutting process. Correct. What, what builds muscle is best is also what preserves Mm -hmm. muscle best. Now, here's one other thing that I want to comment on with the, with the mental piece, people often look at the physiological aspects, what's going to build, what's going to stimulate the most, what's going to, but I, I think you need to consider the mental piece more than anything. Cause if you stop a cut or if you stop your workout or whatever, it's almost always due to something mentally lose motivation, lose commitment. Oh, I don't know if I feel good doing this or, Oh, I, I think I can lift heavier. Why can't I lift as much? So here's another tip. Um, I like to do a lot of body weight type exercises when I'm cutting and here's why. When I do pull-ups, if I lose five pounds on the scale, uh, I'm lifting less weight when I do a pull-up. And so I notice that I'm not, I feel like I get to do the same amount of reps. So it doesn't mess with me as much, right? I like to do body weight dips when I'm in a cut. And I'll use weight around my waist. And it's like, wow, I can, I can lift. I'm on a cut and I'm lifting a heavier dumbbell than I did before. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm 10 pounds lighter too, right? So it, yeah. you got to, cons- and I know talking about it sounds silly, but put yourself in that position and you know, you know what that feels like. So that's the most important thing to consider, I would say. But yeah, what builds muscle the best is what also preserves muscle the best. So consider that. Great. Great. All right. Thanks guys. You awesome. got it, man. Thanks Richard. Yeah. How long did it take you guys as trainers to realize that the <clears throat> mental piece is the number one most important thing oh, yeah. to focus on with your clients? It's huge. And, and to kind of reiterate, like, that being something I had to consider a lot when you're going through a cut was like, um, for, first of all, you're going to, you're going to lift less. You're going to feel weak. You're not going to, it's not going to be the same experience, yeah. I think. And so going through, I think in revisiting it with a different mentality towards it was huge for me. So it was like, uh, not necessarily avoiding it because also too, that was one of the best ways for me to preserve muscle, which was like, uh, I, I used to take it all on at once. So being an athlete, like if I'm going to cut, I wanted to do the most extreme, like cardiovascular, like crazy circuit or like whatever I could do to like kind of punish my way to get there. (laughs) Uh, And so, but I would lose muscle, you know, as I would go through that cutting process and not get to that desired outcome. And so, you know, to train my mind to stay in those same lifts, but realize I'm going to be weaker in those lifts was part of the training. I mean, I think so much of this lifelong fitness 
game that we play as far as like so much of it's psychological it's 95 percent of it so i I mean uh, that's why too i think i get really frustrated sometimes when we like we had the last caller with like the coach where we're like battling like over like just stupid like splitting hair difference type of arguments when it's like really you know the big argument is like figuring out how this person ticks and what motivates them and what keeps them going and what discourages them and why do they quit normally and like piecing that all together and i think as an individual who's listening, like that's trying to figure this out, like that you have to always be factoring that in too. Yep. It's not just, oh, this is the best exercise for this, or oh, this study says that when you're in a cut, you do this and this response. It's like, well, wait a second, like it, that only that only applies if you're perfect about following everything to a T, which I have yet to meet anybody who's like that. Yeah, most people, impossible. yeah, most people are inconsistent. Most people fall off. Most people get discouraged, and so it's like you got to factor all those things in when you make decisions like this. And so I, I just learned over time that man, when I was cutting, because I have this issue with b- building muscle and I used to think that my m- muscle would fall off my body, think about a guy who works so hard to build muscle and then he goes in a cut and then he's seeing his bench press go down every single week. Like that w- would fuck with me. And then I would fall off the diet. I go right back to- yeah, Oh crap, gotta yeah, get back in a bulk. Yeah, I go right back in a bulk because, because of that. Yep. So even mm-hmm. if that was the best thing for me to do, that bench press, because I I've learned that lesson so many times. I know like, you know what, this is a good time for me to do push-ups, you know, mm-hmm. or isometrics or do things that like, I don't have like this arbitrary, like number that I know is like, Oh, I'm strong when I bench press this. Well, I don't have that for body weight push-ups or suspension trainer push-ups yeah. or like weird right. exercises. You like. know what I, you know what I'll say to do to, to I do this even now to this day to help with the psychological piece. When I'm cutting, this is when I'm more likely to work out in a tank top. Cause I can see the definition. So I don't worry so much about the weight when I'm bulking sweater, long sleeve shirt, whatever. Cause I don't care. It's just about how much weight I can lift. Yeah. And it was just something I figured out years ago. It's yeah. like, well, okay. If I can see the definition, I'm not as disappointed that just my sweater wife beater. My, yes. That's <laughs> yeah. both best of both. I used, you know, I used to use creatine like this. So this was like creatine in the cut to help. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I would actually not use creatine consistently and I'd save it for the cuts for a show and I would then start to do it. So I'd get a little bit of, you know, the loading of the water in my muscles. And so I'd get a little fuller look and do the same thing. Or you could be like me and just always use creatine because who cares? Maximize it all. You know, (laughs) (laughs) our next caller is Lewis from the Philippines. Lewis, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, how are you guys doing today? Good, good. Great. (laughs) This is awesome, man. So, uh, of course, before I get to my question, I just want to express like how much you guys have really changed my life and how I get to live. Like, obviously, I found you guys for the fitness and for the health, but you know, the lessons I've learned have transcended so much past that. And like, just a special shout out as well, because you guys talk so much about fatherhood and being a husband. And even for as young as I am, uh, I think that I'm really learning things that I do hope to apply in the future if ever I am lucky enough to become a father as well. So awesome. the rabbit hole I've really jumped into ever since listening to you guys have really been a blessing. So thank you oh, guys. Good man. Good thank man. you. Thank great, you, man. Yeah. A lot more conspiracy, conspiracy theories as well. After listening <laughs> to you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, so, but I'm gonna get to my question. Uh, so I'm 21 years old and I'm a graduating engineering student and I'm about to enter five months of a uh, very heavy review classes for my upcoming licensure exams or board exams. So to give you guys some perspective on that, uh, these review classes are about five days a week of lectures and uh, practice exams. But beyond that, people generally do study all day, every day for five months straight. And a lot of my upperclassmen have warned me that this kind of becomes your life. Uh, not, no real choice there. And it can be very difficult to balance other things with the workload and amount of topics that's necessary for us. So uh, with this... I've been consistently training for about two years now. And over the past year, I have ran anabolic twice and I went on to performance and I actually just ended aesthetics a while ago. And um, my original goal or my original plan rather was to get power lift because uh, I really just wanted to focus uh, on getting as strong as possible. But now I'm not quite sure if this temporary shift in lifestyle and a whole lot of added stress from the review classes would be complemented by a program so focused on percentages and maxing out for a competition. Uh, but that being said, I'm definitely not looking to compete in anything. I just want to get as strong as possible. But my question is, how should I change my training and nutrition in what's probably going to be the most stressful five months of my life so far? 
And is it still realistic to focus solely on strength or should I just look to maintain general health for now? What a Cr- great question. Great question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very Maps well. 15, though, for sure. That's it. Yeah. Maps 15. When, when do you start this period of five months of, of uh, study? When does it start? Uh, January. January 4. Oh, January 4. Mm-hmm. Okay, so up until then, you can train like you normally are. Um, but once you get there, MAPS 15 would be the perfect program for you. You're absolutely right. The, 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 the stress, because your body, um, yes, there's different kinds of stresses, but they do all accumulate. So mental and emotional stress can definitely accumulate and take away from your body's ability to handle physical stress. And if you throw too much physical stress on your body during that period of time, you're going to suffer uh, both physically and even mentally. So it could actually hurt your ability to do things like study, take tests. You'll notice your sleep will get worse and then it kind of becomes this downward spiral. MAPS 15 would be absolutely perfect because you get to be active every single day. There's still a good strength focus on it. Um, and it's easy to stay consistent and it should not take away from your ability to do uh, what you're doing with your with your studies for, the net, for, for that five month period. Do you have MAPS 15? Uh, no, I do not. Okay, we'll we'll send that to you. And there's two versions of it. The first one is at home. The second one is more advanced, where you use barbells. With your experience, if going to the gym or is not an issue for you, or you have a barbell uh, accessible uh, at home, I would say go with the advanced version, just because uh, of your experience. Now, after that, after you're done with your your study, and you can get to more of a normal life, then I would go to Maps Powerlift. But uh, I think you'll be surprised. I think you'll be surprised with Maps 15. You'll probably see some progress with it. At the same time. Yeah, I think that we have we have these periods in our life where, you know, we we tend to shift our energy and focus on on different things, whether that be family, work, yeah. school, lifting. And, you know, you're you're in a period in your life right now where this is like super important. I mean, you're you're setting yourself up for probably what your career is gonna be for the rest of your life. Everybody's telling you that, you know, you pretty much have no life other than the studying for this five month one. There's no reason for you to try and also, you know, kick your ass in the gym during that same period of time. If there was ever a period of time when you say, you know what, this is where I'm going to scale back on that, do what I need to do to maintain because I care about health. I want energy. I want mental clarity. I want to be strong. And so you don't just write it off and say, fuck it, don't do anything and just eat like shit. And because that's that will actually impede on your learning and actually you being productive at your school. So you want it to complement this new area that you're going to be like doubling and tripling down on, which is the school. And so map 15, in my opinion, is perfect for something like that, where, you know, you're going to be heavily focused on the studying part. And then you're just going to get in there, get your little 15 minute workout. And I tell you what, like you still could potentially build and see good yeah. results during that time. Cause you you're could actually move forward. Yeah. yeah. You're actually working with your body instead of against it. Like most people would do in this situation. Yeah. Lewis, I have a, a couple questions for you. Cause I'd like to make some, uh, give you some advice for nutrition and then some additional exercise advice. Have you ever tried, uh, like a ketogenic diet or really low carbohydrate diet to see how it affects you mentally? Uh, no, I've never, I've never done low carb or anything like that. Okay. So for some people, now for some people, this is the opposite. You have a little bit of time though, because you have till, you know, uh, the beginning of January. See if you can get yourself into ketosis. So go low carbohydrate, no carbohydrates, high fat, high protein. Make sure you eat enough sodium. A lot of people make a mistake when they do this because you lose a lot of water. So make sure you have a decent amount of sodium in your diet and see if you notice improvements in your cognitive function. If you do, that would be the diet that I would recommend during that period of time. Now, I notice improvements in cognitive function. So if I had to go through a five-month period where I'm going to be testing my mental acuity, mm-hmm. my ability to remember things, that kind of stuff, I would do a ketogenic diet. You have some time to experiment. It would probably take you about three, four days to get into ketosis and maybe three, four days to adjust after that. So you're looking at a week or two, and then you'll know like, oh, I feel better or I feel worse, and then go back to how you were. Yeah, you if know, anything, it's it's a valuable tool if you go through that process. You realize it does help with your mental clarity, your sharpness, uh, to use that to kind of prep in towards like a big test or like, you know, something like that where you're going to need that extra bit of performance cognitively. So, you know, that's just something cool to consider that, uh, you know, we can, ma- we can manipulate these things and find out what works best for our body for very specific needs. So I, I, I do, I, I, uh, uh, piggyback on that. Yeah. Sure. Now the other, the other thing I would say with act with activity is, okay, let's say you follow maps 15 and you're doing 15 to 20 minute workout every single day. Then the rest of the day you're sitting down and you're studying Make sure every 40 minutes or so you stand up and you do about a minute, one minute of activity. So it could be standing squats. It could be band 
presses, it could be push-ups, it could be a walk. But studies show that interrupting your your that long periods of sitting every 40 to 60 minutes or so improves your ability to learn, improves your ability to retain information, and it keeps you sharp. So, so again, every 40 minutes or every 60 minutes, stand up, give yourself 60 seconds of something, and then sit back down. And you'll find that you'll be a lot better. Uh, you'll be able to remember things and be able to do a lot better with your mental tasks. Oh, that's awesome, guys. I'll definitely try and do that. But is, is that something I can just jump right into or is that yeah. something I have to kind of transition to? No, 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 no. You do it now. If you're sitting down for longer than an hour, stand up literally 60 seconds. In fact, I just pulled up a study that I'm going to talk about um, in one of our episodes that showed that this makes a significant imp improvement in a person's ability to retain information. Literally, you stand up and for 60 seconds, it doesn't have to be a hard workout. You just move. So you do 60, you get 60 seconds of stretching or standing squats or some push-ups. You can or walk around the block. You go for a walk and then yeah. come right back. Um, that makes a huge difference uh, with your ability to learn and, and retain information. Um, and even creativity. They actually show improved creativity as well. Do you have MAPS 15, by the way? Uh, no, I do not. What about MAPS Powerlift? Uh, no, I don't either. <laughs> All right, I'll send you MAPS 15, okay? After that, after you're done with your five months of study, then I think you can get into MAPS Powerlift. But I'll send you MAPS 15 right now. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much, man. You got Thanks it, man. For Thanks for calling in. Thanks for listening. I got. I have a, a follow-up question, if you guys don't mind. Yeah, sure. All right, so um, just some context. Like After listening to you guys, I have reverse dieted from eating just above 1,000 calories a day to eating around 22 to 2,300 calories a day. And I noticed that I've stalled at around this point. And if I go anywhere beyond that, I just see a lot more rapid weight gain, which is not that favorable. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, is this stall in calories, um, a sign that I'm not building as much muscle or is it just like, uh, this is like a threshold that my body can handle right now? Yeah. It's, it's a threshold that your current body with your current level of activity and the current constant context of your life can handle. We can't infinitely reverse diet, but your lifestyle, your muscle mass, your hormones, your stress, all those things will affect this. So right now, what you're currently doing, that seems to be the, the, the upper limit. Now, if you change your lifestyle, then that'll change. It can go up or down. And by the way, uh, during this time where we're about to go in this, this you know, five to six month dark phase of learning, I actually wouldn't stress too much about that. I would eat, I would eat to be healthy. I wouldn't really worry about getting lean, trying to build a bunch of muscle. Like you run MAPS 15 feed yourself accordingly as far as like when you're hungry, eat, make good choices, hit your protein intake. But I really, this is not the time that I would be kind of manipulating that. When you get out of that five to six month phase and go into power lift, then I would try and get you to increase calories and and really get after power that lift. That would be a good time to do that, yeah. And I'm just taking a guess because of what you what you do. Uh, you might be, have like a kind of a sedentary lifestyle. Do you, have you ever tracked your steps? Like, so- if we get into power lift, I might have you like do walking with power lift. What are you doing a day? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I, ever since, well, when, when I started listening to you guys, I was doing a lot more cardio. Now I'm just focused on really walking. Uh, so I get around, uh, make around roughly 7,000 steps a day. Right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Not bad, but I could easily. So what I would do is when I get into power lift, I would actually increase your calories and then like give you step goals. I'd say, okay, Lewis, first phase of power lift, I want you to do uh, 9,000 to 10,000 steps every day. And I'm going to bump your calories 350 to 500 calories every day. And let's see if the extra moving is enough to make sure we don't put on too much body fat. The surplus of calories helps you build muscle. And I'd try and reverse you like that. That was what, but I'd wait till you're done with your five to six month thing. All right. Thank you guys so much again. You, you got right. it, man. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, happy holidays, guys. Yeah, yeah. You too, man. Same you to too. you. That's awesome. We got caller from around the world. You know, when, when it comes to like um, diet for, I guess, mental performance, I mean, I know for me, if I go uh, a lot of vegetables, well-cooked vegetables, high fat, high protein, mm -hmm. low to no carbohydrates, I am absolute sharp. It's fasting is even better than that, unfortunately. But the only problem with fasting, you can't fast for obviously forever. But if I did like a 24 hour fast and then you had me have to do some kind of mental performance task, I'm like, I'm on fire. Yeah. So I've identified that. And, and it's, it's, this is good stuff to know for yourself because your life's going to change. Yeah. And it's really cool when you can 
change your diet and your training to improve your life. Yeah, you can adjust things to really benefit wherever you are and whatever season of life you're in or whatever the focus is for performance because performance can be in all kinds of different directions, even if it's relationships or something. Like, you know, I, I'm I'm focused more on being flexible now because I want to, you know, build and foster a, a relationship with, with more people. And so I'm willing to kind of like include maybe some alcohol where I normally wouldn't or, sure. you know, what, whatever the case is, is, my only point to that is that, um, you know, that's something that we can adjust and we can fine tune to be appropriate for wherever you are right now in life. Our next caller is Marcus from Germ Germany. Marcus, what's happening? How can we help you? Hi, Kai guys. Thanks for having me on the show today. Uh, really thankful that you're taking the time to answer my question. Uh, I really appreciate it. Very, thank you very much. You got uh, it, Marcus. So, awesome. as for my issue, I'm 35 years old. I'm quite fit and muscular, I would say. In a normal week, I'm doing resistance training like four to five days, uh, power and yin yoga like four times, and recently up my cardio up to two or three times a week for about 45 minutes. And actually, I'm pretty happy with my balancing my workout and my family family life right now. I have two small kids, so it's you, you know about it. It's quite challenging to do it, but I think I found a good way. But um, since my dad passed away last year at the age of 65, uh, I'm kind of overthinking a lot. And I'm trying to optimize everything with the goal of having a long and healthy life, of course. While, of course, also I want to uh, keep my physique. And in the end, the ultimate goal is to spend as much healthy time with my kids and family and my wife as long as I can. So leaving things like nutrition, stress, and sleep out of the picture for now, uh, how should one exercise to have a most possible long and healthy life? What is most crucial from your perspective? Uh, great question. First off, my condolences uh, for the loss of your father. And, and I know what that can do when you lose somebody close. It can definitely cause you to um, analyze things, look at things, both your quality of life and also, you know, if you're doing things the right way. Was your father a, a smoker by any chance? He uh, actually, he was in the wheelchair. He was smoking. Yes. Yeah. So, so when it comes to longevity, it it becomes a lot of what not to do, a little bit more than what you should do. Um, number one would be not to smoke. Don't smoke. Uh, the second thing would be to not overeat. And then the third thing would be to not be sedentary. Along those lines, when you're looking at your exercise routine or what you need to do, if you look at longevity from a longevity standpoint, it really becomes about being active appropriately and not overdoing it and not underdoing it. In other words, you want to kind of find this nice balance. Now, okay, what does this look like for me? Well, you feel good. You feel good. You've got good energy. You don't feel like you're overtrained. You don't have a lot of joint issues. You're doing the strength training aspect. You've got some cardiovascular component and you've got your kind of meditative flexibility component. I think you're doing all three perfectly fine. Now, the only thing I would say is just try not to overdo it. In other words, try not to just add more and more onto your plate to where you're pushing your body to its limits. Always think in terms of balance. Do I feel better? Do I have more energy or am I exhausted? Am I tired? Am my workouts taking a lot out of me. And that can change depending on how busy your life is, how much sleep you're getting, um, and that kind of stuff. So that's really it when it comes to longevity. Now, and, and like I said, you have all the components in your exercise routine. So for someone like you who's doing everything, that, that would be the thing I'd look at is like try not to overdo it. And then of course, don't overeat, don't smoke. Um, and you're probably, you're probably going to do just fine. To be more specific on the training side, I actually think there's only one program that we have that I would tell a client of mine potentially to run that forever and just keep repeating that over. And I think that if, if, if the goal was just longevity and overall health, and that's MAPS performance. I think the way we phase the four phases in there, because you, there's an endurance component in there, so you're going to get some cardiovascular. There's definitely strength. There's strength in, in, in different planes. There's rotational stuff there's that's mobility. involved in there. There's mobility that's involved in there. That program is, in my opinion, the only program that we have that you could r repeatedly run over, and it really encompasses everything for like long-term health, mm. joint health, strength, cardiovascular health, 
I, I just think that that is when you think when you have a question like this, that's what comes to mind for me is like I would run a routine like very similar to that. And, and that would be the, the core of what I would be doing for my body. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was thinking along those same lines, just uh, personally, what I'm always considering is like um, what where the deficits may lie. So if um, you get focused on a lot of uh, lifts where where, you know, you're doing a lot of deadlifts, you're doing a lot of sagittal plane type movement. Um, you know, that's something where I need to interrupt that. And so I need to to consider more rotational moves. I need to consider more planes of motion going left to right, um, you know, just to get that kind of stimulus. So that way your body reacts appropriately. And two, to Adam's point of this program really does take you through a lot of those different um phases. So naturally you, you also address power, which is something that people don't consider for longevity to move fast is a skill you want to maintain and preserve. Uh, just because anytime, like we're going to face something where you have to react very quickly. Um, and I might slip or something on the sidewalk and how my body reacts is everything in terms of like whether I'm going to get injured or not. Uh, and so to just be able to train that, it doesn't have to be all the time, but it has to be a consideration uh, that you're always kind of rotating all of these types of movements and focuses uh, you know, consistently. So it's just something like, uh, I think more people need to consider that, um, you know, our body has to, to, to be able to be provided with that type of stimulus. So that way, you know, you're strong in a lot more directions. Yeah. Do you have a spiritual practice, Marcus? Uh, what kind of spiritual practice? Uh, uh, my only spiritual practice that I'm doing is, uh, yin yoga, okay. like two or three times a week, a week, just to calm my head and just to, be for my for my to myself for a few minutes. Yeah, because studies you know studies on this show that if you have a practice that allows you to step outside of yourself, uh, so like meditation, prayer, religion, um, and view things from the outside, kind of like this forty thousand foot view, it makes a big difference because um, like you're talking about in your case, you know one of the mention one of the things you mentioned was overthinking it. And it's like, okay, now I'm gonna get super healthy because mm -hmm. somebody close to me passed away, but that stress, and anxiety surrounding that can actually be detrimental to your health. And spiritual practices tend to help a lot with that. They provide meaning and purpose to some of these challenges that we have. And they do show in studies quite conclusively that those practices also contribute to longevity. Now, when it comes to exercise, you can exercise for performance, but at some point, if you're pushing performance, uh, you are taking away from longevity. In other words, getting strong is good, trying to be the strongest man in the world, now you're taking away from longevity, right? Having cardiovascular fitness is good, trying to be the fastest marathon runner in the world, well, that starts to take away from longevity as well. So that's why I talk a lot about balance with the exercise. Did you like, optimize did you, adapt? Did you, Marcus, did you listen to the episode that we just did with Jason Phillips? Actually, I did, yes. Yeah, yeah so I, I, that's a good one. I think he does a really good job. I'm, I've, it's been something that I've been repeating since I heard him say it. He has that his I don't fitness know, triangle. Yeah, his yeah. fitness triangle, and, and it's the, like aesthetics performance at the, at the top. At the top is longevity. Then you have aesthetics, and then you have performance. And you know, the further you move in any of those directions, the more you take away from the other ones, right? So just keeping that in mind as you were structuring your programming, but. Personally, for me, I, I really, that's what I love about performance is I just think it, we did such a good job of kind of, of hitting the broad stroke of everything that I'd want a client to, to incorporate for the rest of their life from a longevity perspective. And Sal is right. You could, you could easily, you know, because the program is called performance, you could start pushing the performance aspect of it so hard that you're trying to hit PRs, but that's not how I would approach that program. I'd go through that program and I'd go through it, not with the idea of like, I need to be hitting PRs every time I do it, just the movements that we address in there and the things like with cardio and mobility, I think we just hit, we hit everything that you need to for longevity in that program. Sounds perfect. It's for me, it's like, uh, for me, ex uh, resistance training is by far the number one fun uh, of all of them. So I tend to overdo the resistance training and not do enough of the cardio, for example. So, for, do you have some kind of recommendation what kind of cardio is the best for my case or is it just whatever, everything is fine, just move? Yeah, you know what's funny about um, like when Peter Atia talks about, because I know you mentioned in your question about, you know, like yeah, the zone yeah. five and all that stuff. The longest living people in the world walk a lot mm -hmm. every day. They walk a lot every single day. 
So probably the healthiest form of just activity is just to do a lot of walking. Now, cardiovascular stamina and endurance, that can be very different depending on what you're doing. Like you could have the kind of endurance that allows you to run 10 miles, or you could have the kind of endurance that allows you to do a 15 minute, you know, high intensity circuit in the gym, both of which will provide some value. And also don't, don't take this out of the equation. You just said something very important. It's what you enjoy. Is enjoying what you do, is that important to longevity? You better believe it. So like doing a workout that you hate for the rest of your life. Well, first off, good luck trying to do that for the rest of your life. But let's just say you did. I think that that would actually take away from longevity. Hating what you do all the time isn't very good for longevity. And studies will show there's a, there's a, there's a certain level of enjoyment that goes into longevity as well. So I do think you're overthinking it a little bit. Like if you like to strength train, there's nothing wrong with doing more strength training and less of the cardio stuff. You just don't want to be so cardiovascular, cardiovascularly unfit that if you do more than 10 reps on a squat, you need to lay down on the ground for, you know, for 30 minutes, right? You want to have enough cardiovascular fitness to where you can work out essentially, but you know, going Makes extreme sense. in any other, any other direction. I mean, it's not really necessary. I, I really think you're really hitting everything I would want you to hit as a client right now. I think, I think all the things that you're incorporating, it, you're really hitting everything. And I think Justin actually made such a good point is that I, you, what you're doing is perfect. And then I would just be having a regular check-in with myself. Am I, am I strong? Could I go for a run for, you know, a mile or two. I, do I how, feel good? how do my joints feel? Yeah. How's my energy feel? Just checking in with yourself. And if you don't check one of those boxes, if you go like, ah, oh, you know what? My my knees and hips have been really bothering me. Okay, well, I need to incorporate more mobility. Mm -hmm. Cut scale back maybe on some of my heavy lifting, include more mobility and focus more in that direction. Or maybe you're like, man, the other day I was playing with my kid and realized I was, you know, running out of air, just running up the hill with him a little bit. Maybe I need to include a little bit of cardio now. And and so I think you have a really good foundation of what you're doing. I think that you're you're probably your Achilles heel is overthinking it and and stressing yourself that way. I don't think you need to do that, but have regular check-ins with yourself on on those aspects of of health, you know, the ability to rotate, the ability for your joints not to hurt, your ability to run for a mile like and if you can't answer yes to all of them, then okay, put a little focus in there. But yeah. if you can, then you're probably doing pretty damn good. Sounds very promising. Yeah. <laughs> looks like I'm on the right track. You yeah. are, Marcus. We're gonna we're gonna send you maps performance. All You're right, doing Marcus. Good, man. It's amazing. Thanks a lot. All you right, got Mark. it, man. Thanks for it's calling. Amazing. Thanks. Have a nice day. You too, you man. Too. You know this longevity conversation. Uh, people can get so carried. He wasn't right. I don't think he was getting carried away. Boy, people can get so carried away with it. Yeah. Like I re I met somebody in in our space who was so obsessed with longevity because studies will show that eating low, super low calories, right? That that is better for longevity. And man, I looked at this guy and he didn't look, he did not look good. He looked no. like he was dying. Eyes sunken. Isn't, in. That, yeah. isn't that what, what um, what's his name? Mark, whatever was all about. And then didn't he get kicked out of that? Didn't, or not kicked out, but he stopped doing that so much. Mark Siston? Yes. Really? Was it, wasn't he hardcore, like know. super, super low cal? Like, you I, know, the, I think what you need to do is define life quality, Okay, define that and be yeah. honest about it. Like, don't right. just be like, yeah, hedonism, you know, just party all the time. No, that's not really life quality. At some point, that's going to that's gonna be hell. But like, what's real life quality? Like, okay, I can, I've got good sharpness. I can, I'm a good partner to my wife, uh, play with my kids. I have enough strength and mobility to do what I want. I enjoy my workouts. I'm learning. I'm growing. And that, I believe, is what we should focus on more than like, how can I live till I'm 110 yeah. years old? Because that can sometimes get carried away. Well, I just think that there's no like real blueprint, you know, for longevity. It's it's a check and balance situation. Yeah. Like there's always things that inevitably like uh, fall off and to, to be able to know how to navigate, I think is everything to be able to like adjust and to be able to put more emphasis in a certain direction. And so I just look at it as a revolving wheel, yeah. a constant. It's, yeah. it's just something to always consider if I'm like so focused on strength, you know, my joints are going to feel it. You know, if it like to, to all those other points where if like I'm playing my kids, I get tired. Like yeah. I just have to like, I just have to always keep that top of mind. Like I can adjust and I can move in a direction that's going to benefit me for wherever I am. And then I can, 
I have to, you know, revisit that again. Yeah. And, and I think that's the point to Sal's point too, is that you don't want to over stress about that. You yeah. just, you just check in every once in a while. You know, you're just, you're, you're constantly just assessing and going like, Oh, you know what? It's been a while since I've been, yeah. I've doing that. You don't, you don't need to stress about it every day. Like, Oh, I'm not doing this. Oh, I'm not doing that. It's like, you're, there's always going to be something you're not doing enough right. of. Right. Like you just, it's in, in, yeah, inevitable. Don't be neurotic about yeah. it. Yeah. And so when you, and when you, when it, uh, it reveals itself in your life, then don't ignore it address it and then implement it. And then, then something else will reveal yeah. itself and you just kind of, you know, ebb and flow like that. But I mean, do you guys agree? I, I really think that maps performance of all the programs we yeah, have, totally. if you were to tell someone, like if someone said, okay, I'm only going to follow one program for the rest of my life, which one you is just it? Just go yeah. through it over and over again, over and over again. Yeah, it would be that one because it's I, be the most complete I, because I train my clients very similar to the maps. I really think so. that we, it, it addresses the big rocks for somebody who is looking for just overall strength, health, yeah longevity, mobility. I just think that. And then again, like the studies are like, it, it, what actually becomes most important is not necessarily what you're doing, but what you're not doing. And mm -hmm. uh, that's why I asked him if his dad was a smoker. At one point I trained a lot of uh, vascular surgeons and some cardiovascular. And that uh, was surgeons. always the commonality. I, right? I asked him, I yeah. said, what's the number one thing that yep. everybody has in common? They're like, Oh, 90% of my patients smoke. I've heard the same so thing. like, if you want to live longer, just don't smoke. That's the biggest thing you could possibly do. Look, if you like mind pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com. And check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was hardest. for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 